This is Cowboy Dancing All Night. Coming Home to North Dakota, Western Sweet Romance, Book 7. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by J. Dice. Chapter 1 Both Being Believers and Good Communication. Mary Garback, Ridgecrest, California. Are you sure this is going to work? Kathy said low to Charlene as they gathered on the sidewalk in front of Peyton Sinclair's used bookstore and bakery. Of course it's going to work, Charlene said with confidence, putting her hand on the door handle and pulling it open. And even if it doesn't, she said, her voice softer, we will simply move on and think of something else. We're not going to wallow in our failures. Goodness, if she'd allowed her failures to stop her, she'd have given up on life 50 years ago. Even though it was March and the official start of spring was just another week or so away on the calendar, ice and snow still piled up along the streets in Sweetwater, and a cold, icy wind blew from the west. Charlene was used to the cold, but the older she got, the more she didn't like it. Although, she supposed falling on the ice was her biggest concern now. Thankfully, the folks in Sweetwater kept the sidewalks relatively clear, and sidewalks were wet, but not slippery. I don't like this pretending, Teresa muttered as she walked by. I don't see why we can't come right out and tell people that we're trying to match them up. Surely most people would be happy and would go along with our plans without us having to deceive them. We are not deceiving anyone. We are simply not telling them everything we know. There's a big difference, Charlene said, jerking with her head to indicate that Teresa needed to keep moving so they didn't bring any unwanted attention to themselves. Peyton was quiet, but sometimes the quiet ones were much more observant, and Charlene didn't want to tip her off to anything. As Vicky, the last of the peacemakers, Sweetwater's quilting club, walked inside, Charlene followed her and allowed the door to close behind her. Peyton had opened just ten minutes ago, and her store was empty except for the peacemakers. Typically, Tuesdays were not busy days for her. Charlene knew this and had planned for it. What she had to say, she didn't want an audience for. They did have a reputation in town, and they couldn't be this obvious with some of the townspeople. But Peyton was new enough that she thought they might get away with it. Plus, it was hard to find Peyton outside of her store. And since they would be matching her up with someone who was just as reluctant to leave his home as she was, it had been a little tricky. Normally, Charlene did not like to match up two people who were too similar, but she felt that in this case, these two were a perfect match. Good morning, ladies, Peyton said cheerfully from behind the counter where she set out bottles of syrup. Charlene glanced around the interior. One half of the store was filled with bookshelves stacked with books. There were tables scattered around and sitting along the windows in the front. There were bar stools along the counter. In the back, although she couldn't see it now, there were several more comfortable chairs for people who wanted to sit and read for a bit. To her surprise, she saw Owen, Peyton's 12-year-old son, setting a napkin dispenser on a table and walking back toward the counter. Owen's eyes were big and hopeful and had questions in them. He had specifically asked that they work on getting his mom matched up with someone, which is why, even though Charlene would have waited a bit longer, they were here today. Obviously, Owen was asking her if they were there for what he hoped they were and she gave an almost imperceptible nod. The boy's eyes got bigger and brighter, and Charlene, after taking a quick glance at Peyton and seeing she was deep in conversation with Miss Vicky, brought one finger up 
and touched her lips with it. Owen didn't need any other sign from her, and he nodded eagerly. She gave the boy another smile. He was going to be a good man someday, and if this was successful, she would have found him a good dad. Maybe that's part of why she did what she did why she was so eager to see people finding someone that they could spend the rest of their lives with. That, and she hated to see people leaving Sweetwater. What can I do for you ladies this morning? Peyton said as they gathered on the other side of the counter from her. You didn't happen to make your French toast bake this morning, did you? Kathy asked hopefully. No, I've been doing that on Saturdays. And while it's extremely popular, I didn't want people to get tired of it. I think I'm going to keep that to just a Saturday thing. The ladies nodded. Charlene figured it was better to keep people wanting more than to have them sick of it. There was a fine line there, and sometimes it was hard to see the boundary. We're here to have some of whatever you made today, and we're hoping you would join us for a bit because... We have something we wanted to ask you. Okay, Peyton said, giving Charlene an uncertain look, like she couldn't imagine what Charlene would want her to sit down and talk about. Don't worry, we're not going to ask you to do anything hard. I actually think you're going to thank us. Charlene figured she'd be thanking her on her wedding day, but she might even be thanking her today because they had something that she was pretty sure Peyton was not going to be able to refuse, no matter how much she didn't like to get out of her shop. Sounds good. I have tater tot casserole, and I'll bring you all a piece. If no one else comes in, I'll sit with you for a bit, too. If Charlene thought she could get away with it, she'd go over and lock the door. But that would be pretty obvious. And one thing she didn't want to be was obvious. The ladies had removed their coats and hung them on the hooks beside the booth, while Charlene slipped out of hers. As she turned to hang it up, she saw Owen putting his coat on and slipping unobtrusively outside. Maybe she wouldn't have to worry about locking the door. Maybe Owen was going to post himself as their guard. Charlene smiled to herself. That kid had a good head on his shoulders. Although, her smile slipped a little as she figured that he also was pretty desperate to have a father. Well, she was going to do her best for him. The ladies had barely gotten settled in their booth when Peyton came back, holding a tray with four plates and four cups of coffee. The coffee was certainly welcome on a morning like this morning. And while the tater tot casserole would not meet with her doctor's approval, it smelled heavenly, and Charlene's mouth started to water. Maybe, if her plans came to fruition, Peyton would end up living 30 minutes from Sweetwater, and she might close her bakery and bookstore. So, she would enjoy the tater tot casserole today. It might not be good for her heart, but her taste buds would not be complaining. They passed around the plates and coffee, and Peyton set some creamer on the table before putting the tray on the counter and sliding a chair from one of the tables over to the end of the booth. You ought to start serving some of that fancy coffee you get in the big city, Vicky said as she stirred half a cup of sugar, more or less, Charlene judged, into her coffee. You could charge more for people who measure their sugar with a feed scoop, Charlene mumbled. Vicky pretty much ignored her as she grabbed the creamer, pouring out almost half of her coffee onto her saucer and filling the rest up with creamer. I'm sorry, Peyton said as she watched Vicky doing surgery on her drink. I forgot you don't drink coffee. I'll try to remember to serve you tea next time, although I could bring it now if you'd like. Don't worry about it. I almost have this stuff edible. Vicky said as she stirred what looked like very dark milk in her mug. Charlene faced the door, and she could see Owen outside, stomping his feet on the sidewalk. It wasn't the bitter cold of mid-January, but she figured they'd better get this conversation going. 
While we have your attention, we had something we wanted to talk to you about. She began, thinking that was a pretty good opening. So you said, Peyton replied, and Charlene had an inkling that maybe Peyton wasn't quite as naive as what she had hoped she was. Maybe she'd been talking to some of the other people in town and knew that sometimes the peacemakers didn't just make quilts. Charlene slapped on her most charming smile and tried to stir her coffee with a complete air of innocence. We know you love books. I do, Peyton said easily, glancing over at the tall bookshelves, some filled to the brim and running over with books stacked on top and, in a few places, stacked on the floor. And something that someone who loves books can never resist is more books, Kathy said, almost as though she were reading it from a teleprompter. Charlene loved her, but she was almost as bad as Teresa when it came to needing to be a little bit devious. Nothing unethical, just coloring the world with her own markers instead of using the crayons they'd been handed. That's how Charlene liked to think about it. After all, there was no sin in coloring. I suppose I've resisted a few books in my day, Peyton said with a small smile. Oh, we're not asking you to compromise your values in any way. In fact, this is actually something you can do and feel good about, because you'll be helping someone else, Charlene said. It really makes you feel good when you help people, Teresa added to the conversation. She usually only sounded authentic when she was sure that what she was saying was exactly true, with no other way to interpret it. Charlene could respect that. Some people were born with that black-and-white type of personality and never saw any shades of gray. To her, the whole world was a shade of gray for the most part. Peyton nodded, looking relaxed and sanguine. Charlene looked around at the rest of the ladies, then took a deep breath and dove in. I don't know if you've ever been north of town and seen the old Shaker Mansion. I haven't. Maybe this summer I'll get out a little more than I did last. With moving here and getting everything settled, I just never took time to explore the area. Charlene wanted to add it didn't help that Peyton was such a homebody, but she didn't. It would be good for Owen to get out and see the countryside. There are lots of interesting things to check out. Charlene shouldn't have mentioned Owen because it reminded Peyton about her son and that he should be somewhere around. Sometimes he slept in, and if it wasn't a school day, Peyton would allow him to. Hurrying to head Peyton off from looking for Owen, Charlene said, I saw him put his jacket on and step outside for a bit. Peyton's eyes went from roaming the store to meeting Charlene's before she nodded and smiled. I know he's 12, and Sweetwater is a small town. Nothing's going to happen to him, and he's responsible enough to get on the bus when it stops. But I still remember when he was little and needed me all the time. Being a mom of small children is a hard habit to break, Kathy said, patting Peyton's hand. Charlene nodded giving a second or two of space before she completely changed the subject. Just about the time you moved in last year, Bryce Shaker moved into the Shaker Mansion. He's single, living alone. Charlene didn't give any more details. Not about the accident, not about the scars, not about Bryce being bitter and angry and having a very public exodus from social media after retiring from baseball in the middle of the season where he had once been the highest paid athlete. After the accident had left him broken and scarred, his career had sunk into the toilet. Yeah, it might be best for Peyton to find all that out on her own. Chapter 2 well, my husband and I have been married for 41 years, 
and together 43 years total. All marriages are different, but for us, it is communication and laughter. We enjoy each other's company, so we're together a lot. We laugh every day. My hubby is a nut. He is the best husband, dad, pawpaw, son-in-law, brother. Diana Brenneman, Liberty Center, Ohio. That's nice, Peyton said, sounding like she didn't really care one way or the other if there were single men living alone here, there, or anywhere. Charlene hadn't gotten the full story of Peyton's husband and marriage out of anyone yet. She held it pretty close to her chest, although Charlene could tell from her accent that Indiana probably wasn't the state she grew up in, although it was the state she claimed to be from. I just wanted you to have all the facts, Charlene said, trying to make it sound like she wasn't setting her up, even though that's exactly what she was doing. However, there really was a need, and she was hoping to sell Peyton on it now. All right. Peyton lifted her brows, as though asking if there was more or if she were excused. Since you haven't seen the Shaker Mansion, you don't know how big it is. But after the Sweetwater Ranch, it's probably the biggest house in North Dakota. It might even be a little bigger than the Sweetwater Ranch although it's probably not as grand. Charlene had never thought to compare the two of them. It had been years since she'd been out to the Shaker Mansion anyway. I used to be very good friends with Bryce's mother, who sadly passed away from lung cancer a few years ago. That is sad, Peyton said automatically, with the other ladies nodding in agreement. It was tragic since Bryce and his brothers had lost their father in a farm accident years before. That's what caused Mrs. Shaker to pack up and leave. That was actually pretty good for Bryce, because he wouldn't have been a great baseball player here. Teresa added that little tidbit, and Charlene nodded. It was true. He had shown promise on the ice, but they had moved to South Carolina, where his mother had originally been from and he finished his schooling there. I can understand leaving after her husband's death. Things were probably hard for her, Peyton murmured, which made Charlene curious again as to what her past was and why Owen was an only child with no father. Maybe those facts would come out as a result of what she was about to say. There was a library in the Shaker Mansion, huge, more than 6,000 volumes. I don't remember exactly how many there were when they closed the house up and Sheila left. Anyway, Bryce had gotten some work done on the mansion, and I spoke with one of the guys he had hired. The man mentioned that Bryce was looking for someone to organize his library, and, of course, I immediately thought of you. For the first time since she'd sat down, Peyton's eyes brightened, and she looked interested. It took her a few minutes. Then finally she let out a breath and shook her head. I owe you all an apology, she said firmly. She slowly shook her head again. I was certain you guys were sitting here thinking you were going to match me up with someone, and I was not going to have it. I am not interested in getting married again. So I was going to listen politely, but I was going to shut you down immediately. She sighed, shaking her head yet again, like she just could not believe herself. I'm sorry. I should have had more faith in you. I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions, but should have given you the benefit of the doubt. Why, thank you. I agree. So many times we jump to conclusions when we haven't heard the whole story and we really don't know all the facts. Charlene was very proud of how her voice sounded sympathetic and slightly offended, but very forgiving as well. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see Teresa swallowing her tongue, and she appreciated that. She just hoped she could keep it down for the duration of the meeting, 
because sometimes when Teresa's tongue got unhinged, Teresa had a tendency to shout out the truth, like she drank a truth potion for breakfast every morning. Sometimes it was okay to not say things that were true. A person didn't have to utter every word that was in their head. There was a Bible verse about that somewhere, Charlene was sure. Maybe she'd dig it up later for Teresa. That's exactly what I did. Peyton spread her hands out in front of the table, glancing around at the four ladies with a sincere look of apology on her face. Because you are exactly right. Six thousand books? Organize a library in a mansion? That sounds like something I would absolutely love to do. And he'll pay you. Charlene lifted her brows, knowing from Peyton's reaction she would have done it for free. No way. Charlene nodded smugly. Yes way. He has zero desire to do it, although, she was quick to add, I do believe he likes reading. He just doesn't like organizing things. She didn't want Peyton to think that Bryce did not like books or reading. That would be a terrible strike against him for a bookshop owner. Charlene actually had no idea whether or not Bryce read, but she figured it was probably a safe bet to say that he didn't like organizing, because he was having someone else organize his library. He doesn't have to pay me. I would do it for free, Peyton said. Her posture completely changed as she leaned forward on the table, her eyes bright as she looked at the ladies, obviously eager and very interested. I don't know exactly how much it will pay, but I can find out. Charlene actually knew very little about the job, although she had talked to Bryce briefly on the phone. Peyton's eyes fell. She looked around her shop. Maybe I shouldn't take it on. That's a lot of books, and I have to make this work. I need the income to pay my bills. Even if the job pays, I can't just walk away from this. Because that job isn't going to last forever, and this is what I'm depending on to support me. We have an idea about that, Vicky said, setting her coffee milk down and pouring the overflow that was in her saucer into her cup. Charlene couldn't watch the travesty that woman did to coffee. You do? We talked it over amongst ourselves before we came here to tell you about it. Because we knew your shop and your store here is important. No one can just walk away from their business. But the opportunity to see this library and organize it yourself is one that doesn't come along very often. Or ever. I can't believe it. As far as I know, it is the largest private library in the Midwest, although I suppose you could probably look that up online, Charlene said, pushing the opportunity a little more. Peyton was acting exactly like she hoped she would, and while Charlene didn't want to start celebrating just yet, she was pretty sure things were going to turn out exactly the way she wanted them to. Yeah, wow, I don't have nearly that many books here, and this isn't a private collection. I've been accepting donations from all over the state for months. People have started coming from all over the state because they know you have a large selection, Vicky pointed out. Peyton nodded. That had been part of her business plan when she had talked to the ladies before. The ladies and I were thinking, with it being spring, we usually like to get out of the church basement for a bit. It's been a long, dark winter, and we wouldn't mind setting our quilting aside. Not permanently, and not completely, but a little bit. What Vicky is saying, Charlene interrupted, is that we would be willing to watch your shop for you if you want to spend some extra time out at the mansion. Not every day, but say Tuesdays, or, you know, when Owen is at school, so you don't have to worry about watching him out there. Teresa set her empty coffee cup down and pushed it toward the center of the table. Yeah, that's a lot further from school, 
and I would have to make sure that I was back in time to pick him up or make sure I was here. You were just saying he's old enough to take care of himself. It certainly won't harm him to be here without you, especially if we're here too, Charlene said, trying to sound matronly and wise. Like she was a good choice for a mother who was looking for someone to watch her child. Peyton nodded, one hand on her chin tapping it, like she was thinking. It's possible you might be able to take him out with you, but I didn't ask that while I was on the phone. That's something you'll have to work out between yourselves. Peyton stayed quiet and thoughtful for a few minutes. Charlene tried to keep her excitement and anticipation from showing, almost certain Peyton was going to bite. Finally, she gave her head a shake. I would love to do this, truly, but I can't impose on you ladies like that. I can't just leave my responsibilities and run off to do something that I want to do, for pure pleasure. It would be different if you were doing something frivolous, but this is a paying job, and it would be something you wanted, true, but you would still be making money. Plus, you'd still be making money here at the shop. Well, after I paid all of you, there probably wouldn't be much left. And I'm not complaining about that. If you were working for me, I need to pay you. Oh, we weren't planning on you paying us at all, Teresa said. And for once, Charlene was glad of her straight-shooting ways. We just want to do it to be nice so that you didn't have to worry about your shop while you're gone. After all, between the four of us and a few other ladies in my community who could give us a hand, surely we can hold the fort down at least semi-well. We can all cook, Kathy added. And since you're not making any of that fancy coffee stuff, pretty sure we can all make a simple plain pot of coffee. Except for Vicky. We won't let her touch the coffee pot, Charlene said, figuring if they did, Vicky would find a way to put tea or, God forbid, hot chocolate in it. Oh, you ladies are so nice, Peyton said as Charlene held her breath. I know I should probably think about it a little bit, but the idea is just so wonderful, and you guys are truly willing to be here so that I wouldn't lose out on any business. I don't see how I could possibly turn it down. I'm sure you could work something out with Bryce where if things aren't working out for you, you have the option to stop and give the job to someone else. Charlene said, not wanting to, but knowing that sometimes people just weren't compatible, and they were kind of taking a risk on Bryce. He wasn't abusive. She'd heard from good sources that he had a young daughter and was an excellent father. If it hadn't been for that, as much as she might have wanted to see him with a really wonderful woman, because of her long friendship with Sheila, she might not have moved on this. Do you have his contact info? Charlene nodded, but then she said, You can just go out. Anytime. He's there all the time and he'll give you instructions once you get there. I don't think he likes to talk on the phone. That wasn't entirely true. At least, she didn't really know. She did know that she didn't want Peyton to talk to him on the phone and never see him face to face. It would be too easy for Bryce to give her directions and then avoid her, as big as that house was. It would also be too easy for Bryce to offend her and have Peyton quit before she started. Peyton seemed to be too excited about the thought of all those books to question how odd it was to not call or text, but to just go out. She didn't even blink, but slapped her hands together and said, All right, how soon are you ladies ready to start? We're here now. You can show us around, tell us what we need to watch, and at the very least, you can go out and talk to Bryce today, even if you don't end up starting until later. Charlene looked around the group. Does that sound good to you ladies? 
The question was a bit perfunctory and a little bit for show, since they talked about it earlier and decided today was the best day to start. Still, even Teresa looked almost natural as they nodded their heads and said, We'd be glad to. Chapter 3 Touching and Talking Throughout the day, reach out and touch your mate. Hold his hand, rub your hand across his back, touch his arm. Keep the spark alive. Talk to your mate not just about household things, but like when you were dating. Terry Silva, Porterville, California Bryce Shaker walked through the kitchen of his mansion past the sterile countertops, stainless steel appliances, high ceilings, and recessed lighting. The sun was just coming up, and the breakfast nook had been perfectly placed to have an unobstructed view of the sunrise. It was one of his favorite places in the house, and he sat at the small table, setting his coffee down and sliding into a chair. Not that he necessarily enjoyed the sunrise, although he supposed it was human nature to enjoy beauty of some sort. It used to be he would look at the sunrise and see promise, eager to get out of bed and face his day. Nowadays, it almost felt like God laughing at him. After all, his dreams had been dashed, his face ruined forever, and his career over because of a freak accident that God could have prevented. But he hadn't seemed fit to, and now Bryce sat here in North Dakota, at the house he had always meant to retire to, miserable. Because life hadn't gone the way he wanted, expected it to. He heard people call him bitter and angry, and he supposed that was absolutely true. He felt bitter, and he definitely felt angry. Life wasn't fair and he hadn't gotten what he deserved. His eyes shifted from the sunrise to a small mirror in the kitchen that sat above an old-fashioned buffet. On that buffet were several pictures of his daughter. His look softened, and he almost felt like smiling as he stared at her. She'd be eleven soon, and he couldn't believe she was growing up so fast. Of course, that thought had to be followed with the thought that it wasn't fair he didn't get to see her but once in a great while. Again, he thought of selling this place and moving to South Carolina where his daughter was being raised, but he would not because of his scars and his grotesque ugliness. He didn't want his daughter to have to grow up with someone like that beside her, someone she was ashamed of someone who embarrassed her, someone she would rather not be around. It was better this way, even if he hated it. He had just opened his laptop to check his portfolio and see how his investments were doing when he noticed headlights in the distance. Although the sun had broken over the horizon and the most colorful part of the sunrise was over, the angle of the sun hadn't quite risen to the point where the morning was bright and cheerful. Behind the headlights, he could see a small car, blue. It was obviously not new. Whoever it was, it was not someone from his baseball days, although he wouldn't know why he would have thought it would be. No one visited him. No one wanted to. Maybe it was just someone who was too curious for their own good, and the car would be turning around and leaving. Sometimes he had some of those. Curiosity seekers, people who ignored the no trespassing signs and the private drive signs and the enter at your own risk signs, and drove the entire way to his house. But no, this car stopped, the headlight shutting off and the figure inside moving. As he watched, the door opened and a woman emerged. She was dressed for the North Dakota temperatures, with a heavy coat, a beanie from which her long, honey-blonde hair escaped, jeans, 
and warm boots. She looked around, taking a moment to smile at the landscape. Then her eyes were once again on the house, taking it in, like she couldn't quite believe how big it was. He had that feeling too, even though he'd seen plenty of grand houses. In North Dakota, big houses were uncommon. It was then he realized his dogs had been barking, and he'd never let them back in. So, as he watched, they ran around the side of the house, greeting the newcomer. They were large dogs, Rottweilers mixed with St. Bernard's and maybe a few other breeds, shaggy enough to keep themselves warm in the winter, but with enough of the Rottweiler characteristics that they looked scary. In reality, both of them took after the St. Bernard in them with their calm, docile personality, friendly to strangers. They would definitely let him know if an intruder was at his house, but they were far more likely to welcome them inside, showing them all the treasures of the house, and even helping them carry the loot back out, than they would be to bite anyone. Still, they were large and scary looking. He shoved back away from the table quickly. Most of him really didn't care if the person who was visiting left faster than she came, but his mother had instilled enough manners in his childhood that he didn't consider not striding to the front door and calling Duke and Daisy back. They obeyed immediately, and the woman looked up, shading her eyes even though the sun was at her back. Yeah. She probably needed to shade her eyes. She wasn't used to seeing anything quite as ugly as what he was. Chapter 4 First and foremost, God needs to be the head of the family. Only then will your spouse and you be able to live together in one unified marriage. Marriage can be hard even if God is in control. So start off putting him first, and all the rest will follow. Nancy Spencer, Mayfield, Kentucky Peyton's heart hammered in her chest as she stood by the front bumper of her car and watched as two humongous dogs barreled toward her. She thought she saw a little Rottweiler in them, and while in her mind she knew that Rotties were actually very gentle, She'd seen enough headlines of people being mauled to death by dogs trained to attack that her feet itched to run back to her car door and climb in. Still, she could hear her pap's words in her ear, something he'd said when she was a young girl more than once. Their neighbor had a big, scary dog. At least, it seemed big and scary in her little girl's mind. He would say to her, Stand your ground, honey. Dogs love to chase things. And if you run, I guarantee you they'll be running after you. Maybe they weren't typical words of wisdom that other people might get from their grandparents. But Pap had been a very down-to-earth South Carolina farmer who didn't sugarcoat things. Life was hard, and he didn't try to pretend it wasn't. He was a good person for her to have in her life, since her head had always been in the clouds, and she was always dreaming and making up stories and imagining outcomes for things that were always better than what they ended up being. She supposed her ex-husband had finally crushed that part of her that always believed in happily ever afters. Life wasn't a fairy tale. And she would not be cowed by two dogs who didn't have enough intelligence between the two of them to fill a teacup. Of course, sometimes she wondered whether she had that much intelligence in her head. Still, she didn't back away, but she didn't look up at the spooky-looking mansion again either. Miss Charlene had said Bryce was hiring people to help fix it up, but apparently they hadn't gotten to the outside of it. Since the paint was chipped and peeling, there were dead vines attached to the side of the house, and it looked like the flower planters hadn't been tended to in a decade or more. 
since skeletons of weeds stood against the house where the snow hadn't crushed them over the winter. Funny how she could make up a story in her head and act it out beautifully in her mind's eye, but she was a terrible actress in real life. Dredging up her inner Marilyn Monroe, which, admittedly, might be more like another famous Marilyn, she forced cheer into her voice and said, Hello, boys. It's nice outside today and it looks like you guys are on a walk. They stopped in front of her, no longer barking but sniffing, her feet first, then her hands, and slowly their tails started to wag. She didn't breathe a sigh of relief. Not until the door opened, a man shouted names, and the dogs ran to him. Because of the angle of the sun, still low in the sky and casting long shadows, she couldn't see the man on the porch very well. She lifted her hand to shade her eyes even though at some level she knew it was pointless since the sun was behind her. That didn't help her see any better, but it gave her a minute to remember she was here on business and the man in front of her must be the person she wanted to see. She strode forward, pushing her shoulders back and keeping her chin up. Her husband had crushed her spirit when he had walked out, but in the years since, she'd tried to convince herself he'd done her a favor, even though she'd been living with his mother, who would have preferred to have her move out so her son could move his new girlfriend in. She finally couldn't take it anymore, and while she believed that love never failed, she figured she probably just hadn't been very good at showing love to Matilda, since Matilda had all but thrown a party on the day that she moved out with Owen. She could only imagine that the next day her ex and his girlfriend had moved in. Regardless, Maybe it was those years of trying to love someone who seemed unlovable had not changed Matilda, but they changed her. Hello, she said as she walked up the steps to the front porch. You must be Bryce. She held her hand out, not allowing herself to show the insecurity that she felt. The man's face did not look welcoming at all. Miss Charlene had failed to mention about the scars. On purpose, maybe? It wouldn't have made any difference to her, but it might have helped if she had had some warning. There were definitely scars. Unlike her scars, they were visible. His lips twitched, the scars keeping them from moving naturally, and Peyton studied the angle of his chin, the nose that slashed like a blade through the center and the full lips. Even without the gorgeous blue eyes, the man must have been extremely handsome at some point. That made her even more leery, because in her experience, handsome men were often snakes. Several long moments passed while the man stared at her. She was about to drop her gaze when his eyes dropped and his hand came out, just as scarred as his face, gripping her hand with the three fingers he had left. I'm Bryce. I'm wondering how you know my name. His voice did not sound welcoming. His cold manner made her hesitate, and she pulled her hand back. Miss Charlene had made it sound like the man wanted his library cataloged, like he was looking forward to it. After all, if he was willing to pay for it, surely that meant he would welcome her presence. But there was nothing welcoming about him. He must have rushed to the door because he wore no coat and stood before her in a t-shirt and jeans, with stocking feet, short cropped hair, and what she was pretty sure was a scowl under his scars. She had other things to think about, but her eyes dropped again to the hand that she had just shaken, missing the pinky and ring fingers. She looked over at the other hand. It looked whole, although long, thick scars with jagged edges ran up his arm to where they disappeared underneath his T-shirt. Maybe I was given information that was not accurate, 
she began, speaking carefully, because somehow his attitude rubbed her the wrong way. Maybe he had a lot of people visiting that were trespassers, wasting his time or vandals, expecting the mansion to be unoccupied. She wasn't sure, and she tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, keeping her voice even. But Miss Charlene from Sweetwater, a member of the Peacemakers, told me that she had spoken with you. The man didn't move while she waited, looking at him, waiting for him to confirm that he had indeed spoken with Miss Charlene. Go on. He was tall, much taller than she, and she had to crane her head to look at him, but that was okay because it helped her keep her chin up. She said you were willing to pay for someone to catalog your library. I had asked for contact info so I could contact you about the job, but she told me that I could just come out. I hope that was okay. It's really not. I don't like unexpected visitors. He stopped speaking, and Peyton wasn't sure what she should say in return. Because, after all, she was an unexpected visitor, and he had basically said he didn't like her. She didn't want to take it personally, but how did a person respond to a comment like that and to the obvious expression that the man didn't want her there? Well then, if you're truly interested in having your library cataloged, I can take your info and contact you so we can set up a time for me to come out. If not, I'm sorry I wasted your time this morning. Her time had not been wasted. The sunrise had been gorgeous, and she'd watched it the entire time she had been driving out. If she left now, she might possibly get back before the peacemakers had served many customers, and no one would know that she'd abandoned her store in order to come to this... this crumbling mansion with this sour man who reminded her way too much of her ex. The man just stood there, like he didn't want to give her any information about himself. She had decided to go when he finally said, Pull out your phone and I'll give you my number. I don't want you to bother me before nine o'clock and no texts or calls after six in the evening. His eyes narrowed. And I'm honestly not sure I want to hire you for the job. It's a big one and needs to be handled correctly. Not by some slapdash girl who thinks she somehow has some qualifications because she read a book once ten years ago. His words were uncalled for, and Peyton almost forgot the ten years she'd spent working on loving her mother-in-law, despite the unkind comments, verbal jabs, and the muttering under her breath. If it hadn't been for Owen, she probably would still be there but she couldn't believe that it would be good for Owen to be around someone who was so constantly negative. She found him picking up some of her mannerisms and her comments, and she didn't want her son to be smothered with negativity. Maybe she should have stayed. It seemed like she could find negativity no matter where she went. Well, she hadn't been looking for a job this morning when she got up, and she'd be just fine without it when she got home. You know what? I don't think you and I would be very compatible. I'm sure you can find someone else who is much better suited for the job than I am. I wish you luck. Chapter 5 Treat your husband or wife the way you would want to be treated. Mary Altus St. Louis, Missouri. Feeling pretty good for about three seconds, Peyton turned and walked down the steps, trying to pretend she wasn't stomping, and strode to her car. She was rather proud of herself that she didn't run. Without looking at Bryce, she got in, started it, and backed out. She didn't need that man, and she didn't need his library and she didn't need his mansion, no matter how intriguing it looked. Some of her bluster had faded by the time she pulled into the back of her shop in Sweetwater. 
She was ashamed of herself for losing her temper by the time she'd finished telling her story to the peacemakers. Tuesday was a terribly slow day for her, and the shop was empty. All four of the peacemakers were back in the booth where they'd begun the morning, all of them with coffee in front of them except for Vicky, who finally had her tea. And so I left, she said simply, feeling stupid. How could she explain to them how upset she'd been at the time? Now it seemed like a simple matter of being an adult, allowing the unkind words to bounce right off of her and giving the man the benefit of the doubt. Maybe his toilet had overflowed that morning. <laughs> Maybe he was out of coffee. She eyed the ladies. That seemed to be what they were thinking. It was something silly, and she'd allowed herself to quit too easily. I knew he was going to be a rather difficult man, Charlene said slowly. I guess I should have warned you before you went out. Yeah, maybe you should have. Although I usually don't lose my temper quite that quickly. For some reason, Vicky's eyes seemed to be more intense and thoughtful. She had no idea what would have inspired that kind of reaction. Yes, I'm surprised at you, Charlene said, and Peyton wondered if she truly meant it. After all, Charlene didn't really know her that well. Still, back home, her friends always said that her personality was very calm, and they could feel it from just being around her. Maybe Charlene was intuitive as well. She wasn't going to be guilted into changing her mind. She put her hands on the table and looked the ladies over. Probably because I lost my temper so easily, and I never do, that's just one more sign that this wasn't meant to be. I thank you all for being so willing to take over things and help me out, but he's going to have to find someone else to work on his library. As much as I would love to do it, it's not worth it for me to have to try to work with someone who makes me become someone I don't like. The ladies were quiet for a moment, and still, before Vicky said, That's funny. I always thought we had the choice of who we are going to become, that we can choose whether or not we give people power over us. Are you really going to let him control you? She had a great point, but Peyton was not going to be swayed. You know, you're right. We can't blame what we do on other people. My temper, or lack of it, is not his fault. But I still believe that's a sign. A sign that he didn't really want me there, and I don't want to be there. I was not looking for a job this morning when I woke up, and it's not really a sadness to lose this one. She shrugged. Maybe they realized her mind was made up, because they nodded sadly, and everyone was quiet until Vicky started talking about Easter, and how there was going to be a sunrise service, and how they were working on the cantata, and hoped it would be ready in five weeks for Easter morning. The ladies left, and Peyton had a quiet afternoon at the bookstore. She only made baked goods for mornings, and once she was out of whatever she made, she was done cooking for the day. It wasn't like a normal cafe, which suited her just fine, because she had nothing to do but sit in a chair and read and ring up the occasional sale for the two or three customers that moseyed in over the course of the afternoon. Normally, when Owen got off the bus, she allowed him to play until dark, since night came so early in the winter in North Dakota. There was plenty of time once the sun went down to get the schoolwork done and do any chores. Often, he ran in the store, barely kissing her before he ran right back out, so she was a little surprised when she was sitting in her chair reading a romantic comedy set in Idaho and revolving around ladies who lived in an assisted care facility who played matchmaker for their town. She had not finished the series because the author had written herself into a romance convention, and obviously she most definitely wasn't talented enough to show up at one of those. 
But the narrator seemed to be an okay guy with his entourage and his helicopter. He seemed very cool and collected, even though he had ladies' underwear flying at him from all different directions. The book turned out to be not terrible, and she thought once the author had a couple hundred more books under her belt, she might not be too awful. That's when the door opened and Owen stepped in. She looked up, smiling. Hello, son. How was school? Normally, she got a non-answer or an okay. But today he walked over, his brows drawn, looking at her like he hadn't expected her to be there. I thought you were going to be at a mansion somewhere tonight. That didn't work out. It didn't? Owen sounded far more disappointed than she had expected. He dropped his book bag and plopped into the recliner opposite her. Nope, sometimes these things just don't work out, and this one didn't. Although the idea of cataloging 6,000 books in someone's personal library was really pretty awesome. Yeah, sounds like something you'd like to do. His tone was dejected, and he looked down at the floor. Did something happen at school today? No. But he didn't move, and that wasn't her son. He was a good kid, quiet. A little bit more quiet than most kids, maybe. And responsible, as only children tended to be. But this was not normal. Something was obviously bothering him. Do you have a lot of homework? No. She hated asking 20 questions and getting one-word answers for all of them. In her experience, he'd start talking to her when he felt like it. Sometimes it was in the evening when they did the dishes together, or before bed. She missed the days when he came home talking a mile a minute, and she couldn't get a word in edgewise. She always listened to him then, because she figured the day would come when he wasn't quite as eager to talk. She hoped he had gotten it in his head that no matter what he was saying, she was interested. That had been her goal, anyway. That, along with being both mom and dad so he wouldn't feel like he was missing out. Still, sometimes just having someone sit with him, being quiet, was all he wanted. So, she closed her book carefully, set it on the small table she had sitting beside the chair, and just sat with him. She didn't stare at him, because she didn't want him to think that she was waiting on him, since that was one thing she hated when people tried to make her talk and the words just weren't coming. She supposed not everyone had that problem, but sometimes she just truly didn't have any words in her head. Today, though, Owen didn't talk. He sat there for probably five minutes before he shifted, grabbing his bag. I'm going to change my clothes. Do you have time to throw a ball with me? He asked. She could leave her store. It was Sweetwater, quiet and safe, and she'd left it plenty of times before. Sure, she said easily, standing and stretching. Owen went upstairs, and she walked to the back of the kitchen where they had a small room to keep their coats and boots and shoes. It was chilly out, and she put on a coat. Her hands would be cold, because she couldn't throw with gloves on. They only had one mitt, and Owen would use it. She supposed this was part of being both mom and dad. Since he didn't have a dad to throw a ball with him, she got to do that too. By the time he came back downstairs in old clothes, she had a sign made out to put on the door. Text me if you need me, with her phone number on it. Taping it to the door, she didn't bother to take the money out of the drawer. There wasn't that much in it anyway, and if someone needed it worse than she did, bad enough to come into a little bookstore and steal it, then she supposed she wasn't so hard up that she couldn't let them have it. Owen and she went out the back door and walked down to the empty lot behind the store. She had pitched to him and allowed him to hit it a few times out of the back lot, 
but they had to be careful, because while there weren't many houses around them, there were houses beside and behind, and she didn't want to break anyone's window. So, usually, they just tossed it back and forth between them. They started with not too much space between them until they got warmed up. He could throw much further than she could. It wasn't really a challenge for him to throw with her, but maybe his friends that he normally played with were busy. Baseball practice starts next week, he announced after they'd been throwing for a while. You're sure that's what you want to do? He'd signed up for it and had gotten the physical. It was a community thing, so everyone had a team. Last summer, he'd been enraptured with horses and ecstatic when a local rancher, Coleman, had agreed to give him horseback riding lessons. They'd quit for the winter, but Coleman had said he'd be perfectly willing to start back up in the spring if Owen wanted to. Have you decided no horseback riding lessons? Or were you going to try to do both? She asked. Last year, the riding lessons had been on Mondays, and Mondays had been so slow for her, she ended up closing for the day. Her book club met on Mondays in the store. I don't know. I've just been really interested in baseball lately. Every spare second, he'd been throwing the ball. On Saturdays, all the town kids went to the park on the edge of town and played pickup games. Funny how a kid got a sport in his head, and all he wanted to do was play it and get as good as he could. Owen had even taken to jogging, although he hadn't been as dedicated to that as he had been to playing the pickup games. Which made sense. Games were more fun. I think you're pretty good at it, she said, supposing that was the mother in her speaking, although she felt her son was naturally coordinated. Which he didn't get from her, she thought ruefully as she missed the ball yet again and jogged off to pick it up. This was one of the times where she wished she had a husband and wished even more that Owen had brothers he could play with. Siblings, at least. I want to get better. Sometimes they let the eighth graders play on the varsity team if they're good enough. I was hoping I'd get good this fall and the coach would notice me and let me play. She nodded, grateful for sports that would keep him out of trouble, hopefully. For a while, she'd been afraid that he wouldn't be interested in anything, since he seemed to have interests but never stuck with something for very long. I'm sure you will. The league you signed up for should really help with that. Everybody there has their dad or their brother or someone they know coaching them. I'm the only one that doesn't have anybody. <laughs> that can't be true, she said, not meaning to sound dismissive, but feeling that way. There was no way that every kid on the team had somebody that they were related to helping with the team. It is. At least, there might be a handful of us who don't. We're the worst players. Everyone else has someone to practice with. What he was saying was everyone else had a dad. She heard that. And that was her fault. Although she was pretty sure she'd outgrown the idea of blaming herself because her husband walked out on her. Still, she could have decided to get married again, or at least put a little more effort into it. But she couldn't marry someone who didn't love her son as much as he loved his own children, and she'd never met anyone like that. Not to mention, it would be hard for her to trust again. After all, She'd been living in a fantasy world. A perfect marriage, perfect family, perfect everything. Until her husband had come home with the cliché lipstick on his collar. She couldn't believe she'd been so gullible. He didn't even do anything new. Just the same old, same old. She felt like a fool. Still did at times. I can help. I'll volunteer. I'll call Ty Hansen as soon as we get in, before I start cooking supper. Maybe she was trying too hard. She kind of felt like she was when his face fell, and he shook his head. No. Really, Mom, I like you and everything, but 
Please don't. That hurt. He'd started doing that lately, acting like there were girl things and boy things, and girls weren't welcome to do the boy things. That was life. It truly was, as much as she sometimes tried to deny it. Boys liked to do things that girls weren't interested in, and there were things that girls liked to do that boys didn't have a lot of interest in. Maybe he just wanted to find his tribe, or whatever the common terminology was for it. Chapter 6 First is really caring about each other, then listening to each other. I was only 15 and George was 19 when we married. If my husband hadn't really loved me and been very patient, we wouldn't have stayed together. He was the love of my life. We were married 59 years when he passed away with leukemia. I've been a widow for 12 years. Life is kind of empty now, so I find enjoyment in reading. Your books have been a great way to spend many empty hours. Virginia Jones, Lawrenceville, Georgia Peyton tried to think of a man who could be a surrogate father to Owen. She had friends whose husbands would help. Coleman, who had given him writing lessons, treated him like a son. But Coleman was busy with his ranch and with the auction barn. He didn't have time to volunteer to do baseball on top of everything else. Especially for a kid he wasn't even related to. Peyton had the feeling that if she were to talk to Coleman's wife, Sadie, that Sadie would talk Coleman into doing it, and he would, just because that was the kind of man he was. I'm sorry, she said, apologizing for everything in one big fell swoop, for being a failure as a mom and a parent, for not being good at baseball, for not being enough to keep her husband happy. Funny how the stupidest little thing could make her feel like she wasn't good enough at anything. It's not your fault, Mom, but the peacemakers told me today that the guy who has the library used to be a ball player. I thought, I thought maybe if you helped out in his library, I might end up being out there some, and maybe he'd help me with my game. Honest to goodness. If her son asked her to go to the moon and jump off and grab a Mars rock on her way home, she'd put all of her effort into trying. There wasn't much of anything she wouldn't do for him. But... I met him today, honey. He's not a very nice man. So? Owen held the ball in one hand, slapping it against his glove, and then stared at her. She knew exactly what he was saying, and she didn't say anything. Come on, Mom. You've told me a million times that when people aren't nice to you, that's just your cue to love them harder. <laughs> that's true. I guess I have said that. Over and over and over again. Funny he would decide to remember it right now, when he'd forgotten every single other thing she'd ever said to him. You said that people who are mean are usually mean because they're hurt. I said that too. You always told me I had to be nice to Grandma, even though she wasn't very nice to us, because God put hard people in our lives to teach us things that he wanted us to learn. A lot of times, one of the things he wanted us to learn was that love is stronger than unkindness and hate. True. Why had she wished earlier that he would start talking? When they'd been sitting in the house, why hadn't she enjoyed the blessed silence of not having her words thrown back up into her face? I guess, I guess a lot of times people say things and they don't really mean them because you can look at a person and tell by their actions whether or not they mean their words. He slapped the ball in his glove, watching it carefully talking without much inflection. She closed her eyes. He'd heard that from her, too. Is there anything that I've ever said that you've forgotten? She asked, not a little sarcastically. 
I listen to you, Mom. You think I don't, but I do. He held the ball in the glove, and he stared straight at her. But I want you to do what you say and not just tell me to do it. His lip pulled back. Most of the time, you do what you say. But... He let his voice trail off. Man... She sighed. She didn't even bother to try to pretend she wasn't sighing. She didn't want to act like it was no issue or not a problem. There was no point in pretending that hard things weren't hard, because when he tried them, he might quit because he wouldn't be expecting them to be so difficult. The man wasn't very nice to me when I went out, and he didn't act like he wanted someone in his library. I... I guess I must have lost my temper a little bit, and maybe I told him he could find someone else to do his library, and maybe I stomped away, although I didn't squeal the tires. She added quickly, like that meant something. It was a little awkward, with the glove on his hand, but he crossed his arms over his chest and tapped his foot on the ground. Mother, be serious. I was being serious, but... Please, please don't make me go back out there and apologize. Are you going to do what you always tell me to do, or are you going to take the easy way out? Another one of the things she always said. She sighed again, louder. She really didn't want to. Really didn't. In fact, she'd almost rather become a snake charmer and wear one of those skinny little bikini tops with the big pants and play a flute and stare deadly cobras in the eyes. Do you think I'd make a good snake charmer? She asked Owen. Mother. She sighed, exaggerated and long, a sigh that could rival any teenager's, telling him exactly how put out she was. Fine, fine, it's fine. I'll go out tomorrow and I'll apologize. Isn't there a verse in the Bible about not letting the sun go down on your anger? Tonight. You want me to do it tonight, she said, her voice incredulous. Hey, I didn't write the Bible. God did. If you want to follow it, that's your choice. Well, had she said that? I don't think I ever said that. No, I made that up myself. Pretty good, wasn't it? She nodded, her lips pursed, really not wanting to do what she knew she was going to have to do. You want me to go with you? I can hold your hand. I'm not a child anymore, she said, mimicking him. Someday, I'm going to say wise things, and you're going to quote me, he said, a little bit like he was lording it over her. You don't have to wait for some day, honey. You were pretty wise tonight. And you're right. I need to go back out. I need to apologize. I'll also ask him if I can still do the job. And you'll offer to do it for free, since you weren't nice earlier today. Wait, what? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Whoa, that verse does not apply to jobs. You can't cherry-pick what you want to believe. Stop. I'll apologize. I'll ask for my job back. But there had better be an awful lot of ice cream waiting for me when I get home. I think I might be able to manage that, he said. I'll see what I have in my piggy bank and get back to you. She grinned, coming over and ruffling his hair, which he was still young enough to not mind. The dread in her chest was only a little twist of pain when he put his arm around her as they walked back to the front of the store so she could take the temporary sign down and put the closed sign up. Apparently, she was going to do some groveling, but only because she loved her son. Or maybe because it was right. Chapter 7 Patience and Forgiveness Monica Perry, Antioch, California
It's been almost a year. Are you seriously going to hide out here for the rest of your life? Dwight relaxed in a recliner, his ankle resting on the opposite knee, a glass of ice water in his hand. Bryce stared at his own water, studying the ice but not really seeing it. Dwight had been the one friend who hadn't abandoned him when everything went down on social media. He'd been hacked, but that's what everyone in his position said, and no one believed him. That, on top of the accident that he had still been struggling to recover from, had killed his career. No one wanted to sign someone who may or may not have used racial slurs, and he wasn't in good physical shape anyway. His friends had deserted him. To be associated with him would be to be branded with the same names that everyone, at least it seemed like everyone, was calling him. Guilty by association, and his friends fled like rats in the light. Except for Dwight. Dwight hadn't quit baseball for him, but he'd stood by him through everything. He'd been exactly the kind of teammate Bryce hoped he had been to everyone else. Back when he was young and stupid and innocent and actually liked people and thought the best of them. I don't see anything wrong with that, he finally said, taking a sip of his water. He wasn't sure why Dwight kept coming up to visit. Scratch that. He knew exactly why Dwight kept coming up to visit. At least, coming to Sweetwater. He'd always stop at the auction and watch one of the Baldwin twins. Bryce wasn't sure which one it was. The cute one, he supposed. Regardless, Dwight was a city guy, and there was no way he was leaving Cincinnati and moving to North Dakota. Yeah, you're rich, and you have your whole life in front of you. Get Kendrick, bring her up here, and get back into life. Who knows, you might find someone. You lost someone? Bryce said, deliberately misunderstanding. No, like a woman, a wife. Someone who appreciates you for your integrity, your work ethic, for the things you accomplish. My employees accomplish everything. I'm a nobody. He knew what Dwight was saying. When everything had gone down on social media, there had been an immense amount of pressure on him to apologize. He couldn't apologize for something he hadn't done. And if he had admitted that he had done it or given some kind of answer that started admitting guilt, he would have been lying, even though that would have gotten him off the hook. So he didn't. It would have been much easier to lie. After all, if he would have apologized, there was the potential that he would have been forgiven. At least, people might have forgotten. Dwight lifted his head, looking out the window, not wanting to argue anymore. Round and round. He had his identity wrapped up in baseball just as much as Bryce had, but no amount of arguing would take away what happened. And Dwight was right. It was time for him to find his identity where it always should have been in his relationship with God. Thinking about retiring at the end of this year, Dwight finally said, casually, like that wasn't a huge bombshell. Retiring? You're at the height of your career. You just signed a huge deal two years ago. I know, two years left on that, but I've lost my fire. I don't care. I've been at camp for the last six weeks and it's hard to feel the drive I used to have. You missed me. You laugh, but it's true. There are a lot of good guys on the team, but there are a lot of jerks, too. It's hard to tell which is which. When I played with you, I knew there was always someone standing for right. As long as I was doing right, you would be at my back, doing the same thing. Dwight's words made him feel pretty good on one hand, but sad on the other. Sad that there weren't more men of character who would stand for right, and sad since Dwight was one of the best shortstops in the game. Just because you lost your drive, because it feels like a job, 
doesn't mean it's time to quit. No matter how terrible he felt, it wasn't right to drag his friend down, too. Dwight deserved to have a friend who encouraged him and tried to point him in the right direction, even if Bryce honestly disagreed. What was the point of life anyway? Just to live and play with a bunch of jerks who wanted to step on him in order to get ahead? There was never anyone standing there with a hand reached out, offering a helping hand. Or, if there was, they didn't really mean it. They just wanted to sound good, but when it came right down to it, they didn't want to go out of their way or put themselves out in any way to help a friend who was down. Yeah, I know. It just... it just feels like it's time. He dropped his ankle from his knee, focused on the glass he held in his hand. Dinner? Bryce said after watching him for a bit. I guess. You talked to the Baldwin twin again, didn't you? Maybe, Dwight said without looking up. Obviously. She rejected you the last time. I can't believe you asked again. I figured if I gave her time to think about it, she might reconsider. You know she's never going to go out with you. He believed in supporting his friend and all that, but the Baldwin twin had never shown any interest at all. It didn't surprise Bryce that she wouldn't be interested in a city boy. Although most girls wouldn't turn down a date with a famous athlete, in his experience anyway, he never had too many rejections at the height of his career. A lot more after his accident. And then he couldn't stand the pitying looks they turned his way. Pity was why he got accepted, and he quit asking after the accident. I guess I'm just a sucker for punishment, Dwight said. I stopped at the auction barn this morning as I came through, since I knew I wasn't going to be here tomorrow for the actual auction. Man, I love watching her work. Bryce almost laughed, because that's what a lot of people said about Dwight. He was just beauty in motion when he was fielding the ball. Funny that he would have that feeling about a farm girl in North Dakota herding cattle. But Bryce knew Dwight was serious, and he wasn't a player. He was the kind of straight shooter that was hard to find. Still, he and the twin were never going to make it, and he couldn't believe Dwight didn't see that. You could go to the auction tomorrow and just tell me about her afterwards, Dwight said with a small smile. Then he shook his head. Never mind, she'd just end up falling for you, and that would be just my luck. I hardly think so, Bryce said, unable to even pull his lips up. There was no smile in him over that. Once upon a time, he might have laughed and said something about trying to steal her away, although he'd never do that to his friend. And he had no interest in the Baldwin twin. The lady that had been here earlier today had caught his eye, but she had been easy enough to scare off, like everyone else. Daisy, lying at his feet, lifted her head and growled low in her throat. It was just a ruse, because Daisy was gentle and loving. It's probably just the wind, he said, leaning down and patting the top of her head. You'd think she would have gotten used to it by now. You've been here almost a year, and it hasn't quit blowing the entire time, Dwight said, not angrily, but maybe a little annoyed. The wind could get to a person out here. I think it might be someone coming, Bryce said with his eyes on Duke. He had his head up as well, a small growl coming out of his throat. Bryce looked at the window, out at the darkness that was descending. It was an odd time for anyone to visit. And an odd time for anyone to get lost. Usually, curiosity seekers came out during the day. For some reason, his mind went again to the woman who had been there that morning. He truly had wanted someone to catalog his books. But he didn't want someone beautiful. Someone with fire in her eyes and long flowing hair. Someone who was slender and kind, who had enough spirit to put him in his place. 
Yeah, he definitely didn't want someone like that. He wanted a grandmotherly old woman or a wizened old man. Or maybe some teenager who might get the books confused but wouldn't tempt him with the maturity in her face and the knowledge that the world wasn't fair, knowledge that matched his. But Dwight was right, because in the fading dusk, he could see headlights. Maybe they'll leave, he said dispassionately. It couldn't be anyone who actually wanted to see him. Still, he had barely uttered the words when his eyes went to the window again. The hair on the back of his neck pricked, and he studied the car intently. Was it blue? He was pretty sure it was, and it was old, and small, and it stopped, and a woman got out wearing a heavy coat, jeans, and boots with honey blonde hair falling around her shoulders. Well, she's a looker, Dwight said. You didn't tell me you had a girlfriend? He looked at his friend, his brows raised. I don't. Maybe his words were a little surly, but the excitement that fumbled in his chest irritated him. He wanted to be nothing but annoyed, not... Why would she be back out here? He stood, walking with his gait that was never quite steady to the doorway, saying as he went, This shouldn't take long. I'll be right back. Oh, don't worry, I'm coming too. Stay. He couldn't say exactly why he didn't want his friend hanging over his shoulder. Maybe his perfect face, unmarred by any accidents. Maybe the fact that if a woman knew anything at all about baseball, she'd recognize him. And if she'd ever seen commercials on TV, she might recognize him too. He was the face of friendly fireplaces. Yeah. Jealousy. That's why he didn't want Dwight to come out with him. Dwight wouldn't be offended. He'd actually probably understand, which was almost as annoying as if he really would be offended. He didn't want anyone to have to be extra nice in order to be able to get along with him. But the fact of the matter was, that was almost the point he was at. He walked through the foyer and opened the door just as she had her hand raised to knock. You again, he said and was annoyed even more when he had to work to keep his eyes from running all over her. That's funny, I was about to say the same thing. He considered her words. Had she just made a joke? He stepped out on the porch, closing the door behind him. Politeness dictated he ask her in, especially since it was getting dark and cold. It might be March but it was March in North Dakota, which meant a lot of wind, a lot of cold, and a lot of wildness. He found he really loved it here. Even if the woman in front of him was annoying him. That's what this feeling of warmth and excitement meant. Annoyance. If he kept telling himself that, he might start believing it. The woman bit her lip and looked up at him from under her lashes. I, I was talking to my son some after he got home from school today. And it's kind of embarrassing to be shown up by a 12-year-old, but he pointed out that I hadn't acted in the best way. Not the way I tell him to act, and not the way I claim to believe. I didn't need him to tell me that, because I already knew it. But once he pointed it out, he knew exactly what I needed to do. He didn't interrupt her. In fact, was a little mesmerized by the movement of her lips. He jerked his eyes away. Maybe he'd been alone too long if a woman came to his doorstep and all he could manage to do was stare at her lips. Maybe he would go to that auction tomorrow night. Of course he wouldn't. He wasn't going out the way he looked. Not ever again. In today's modern world, he did not need to leave his house for anything, not even to pick up groceries, even in North Dakota. And I just wanted to say I was sorry. I got angry, and I shouldn't have. It wasn't right of me.
and I wasn't kind. I was hoping that you would still give me a chance to do the job. I love books. Yeah, he might give her a chance to do the job. Not ever. You could start tomorrow. Where had those words come from? Actually, I can't start tomorrow. Then forget it. She crossed her arms over her chest. It wasn't hard to tell that his comment had made her angry. Seriously, I have a business. I can't just drop everything and be at your little beck and call. If I drop my business and lose it, when this job is over, I'll have no way of making a livelihood for myself and my child. I can't let that happen. I need to be a little bit more responsible, and I would think that you would understand that. It's not like you're offering me a full-time job. Come tomorrow or don't come at all. I will be here Friday night, and I will work until midnight. With that, she lifted her head up, as though daring to challenge him, but she spun on her heel too fast for him to be able to do anything more than open his mouth. If you need to talk to me, you may text Miss Charlene. And if you're brave enough, you can go ahead and let her know that you don't want me. Otherwise, I'll see you Friday night. She stomped off the porch, stomped back down the walk, and yanked her car door open, shoving herself inside and starting the engine before her door was even closed. If she put her seatbelt on, it was while she was driving out his drive. He smiled. Then he laughed. How long had it been since he'd actually laughed out loud? He had to say, he was looking forward to Friday. Chapter 8 Love, Faith, and Perseverance Ginny Durr from Covington, Louisiana Peyton stood at the door to the mansion on Friday night, hoping she wouldn't leave in a huff tonight as she had the last two times she'd been here. Determined in her heart that nothing he would do would drive her away, that she wouldn't get angry, that she would do what her son suggested, which was love this difficult and obnoxious man to the best of her ability, like Jesus did. Nothing like giving her a huge challenge, she thought, as she knocked for the second time. No sounds from within the house. He probably was making it clear that he didn't want her there. She hadn't given him a chance to decline her offer, so maybe he just wasn't going to answer the door. She hardly believed that, though, because the guy didn't seem to shy away from a confrontation. If he wasn't happy with her, didn't want her there, she didn't think he'd sit inside his house cowering and hoping she'd leave. On that thought, she worried that something might be wrong. The last time she'd been there, she vaguely remembered that there was another car over on the other side of the house, more toward what she thought would be the kitchen. Maybe that was the door he normally used, and he had company. Or maybe it was his car. Or maybe his car was parked around back. She couldn't tell. There was also a garage. It could be there. Maybe he wasn't home at all. She knocked again, her nerves making her hands shake and her stomach twist like a leaf blowing in the wind. He could have fallen, or he could be sick, or had some kind of stroke or heart attack. Although, while she couldn't determine his exact age, of course, he didn't seem like he was much out of his thirties, if at all. Wasn't that a little young? Still, stranger things had happened. She pulled her phone out of her back pocket, ready to text Charlene to see if she'd heard anything. Normally, she wouldn't have thought of such a thing, but for some reason, as she held her phone in her hand, her eyes fell on the doorknob. Why not give that a try? The thought had no sooner gone through her head than she held her hand out and twisted. It was unlocked. 
Should she go in? If Owen were with her, she probably wouldn't. But the reason that she'd mentioned Friday when she had been so angry and upset when she'd been out on Tuesday night was because Ty and Louise Hansen had volunteered to keep Owen and take him to ball practice Saturday morning so she didn't have to leave the store at her busiest time. Owen was staying over with several other boys, and she wouldn't need to worry about getting him until three o'clock when her store closed. Ty and Louise had volunteered to do that throughout the spring practices, and Peyton had been grateful. Although a little sad, too, because the idea of facing Friday night, long and dark, without her son, made her feel lonely. Maybe that's why she volunteered to spend Friday night at the mansion, cataloging books. It gave her something to do. Maybe. After all, for the last twelve years, her Friday nights had been occupied with her son. The idea that he was growing up made her feel sad. She focused back on the doorknob under her hand. She'd twisted it, but had not pushed the door open. From somewhere in the house, she could hear the dogs barking, but they weren't right by the door. Why not? Should she open it? He could be hurt. He could need her. So, without allowing herself to think about it anymore, she pushed the door open and stepped inside. She could tell from the outside it was going to be big, but she was surprised at the immensity as she walked in, closing the door behind her. The foyer had cathedral ceilings, with windows the whole way to the top, letting in sunlight so it looked bright and cheerful. Or it would have, if it hadn't been so drab and unkept. Apparently, the foyer wasn't one of the areas where he'd had work done. She'd love to talk to him about the house. Was he getting the whole thing refinished? And where was the library? And should she go directly to the library, trying to find it? Or should she look around for Bryce? Mr. Shaker, she said, her voice sounding hollow and thin. Mr. Shaker, she said louder, realizing that there was some type of thumping coming from down the hall. She lifted her voice as loudly as she could without yelling. Mr. Shaker! She took several steps, and the thumping stopped. She froze. She wasn't doing anything wrong. Not really. Other than letting herself into someone's house without permission. It was kind of like trespassing. Only he knew she was coming, so... It wouldn't count as trespassing. Right? She wasn't quite sure how the law played out in that type of situation, but she liked to think she stayed on the right side of it. Maybe not this time. She wasn't going to let that get her down, though, so she lifted her voice and tried to speak like she belonged there. Mr. Shaker, I'm looking for the library. Something that sounded like a growl came from around the corner and Peyton was slightly tempted to run upstairs or back outside. But she figured if she left this time, she wasn't coming back. Not ever. And she had a library to organize. She had a hunch the library wasn't upstairs, though, so she held her ground, lifting her chin like she'd been practicing all week and pasting a smile on her face. Love. We love hard people. We love angry, bitter, mean, hurt people. She almost laughed at herself. He wasn't that bad. Right? Bryce stomped around the corner, sweaty, hot, tall. He wore a muscle shirt, and he hadn't gotten cheated when he bought it. He wore shorts that came to his knees, along with sneakers and low socks. It was the scowl that caught her eye, though, and the anger, lots of anger. Mr. Shaker, good to see you. If you can just direct me to the library, I won't bother you again. 
I'll be leaving at midnight and I can see myself out. He stood looking at her, his hands hanging down at his sides, and she realized he had boxing gloves on. So that's what the thumping was. You came. I said I would, so I'm here. Library, please? She said in her most businesslike tone. She wasn't going to get railroaded out of his house. She was going to be kind. She was going to be gracious. And she was going to... Maybe she wouldn't be able to love the man, but at least she could be kind to him and not get angry. You're not going to get angry. You're not going to get angry. She wasn't sure that was going to help, but she kept repeating it to herself anyway. Lots of people say they're going to do things, and then they never follow through. Do you or do you not need your books cataloged? Did you or did you not tell Charlene you wanted someone to help you? Did I or did I not say I would? Here I am. She needed to close her mouth, to stop talking already. Still, he didn't move. Finally, almost as though he'd made a decision, he shifted, then nodded behind her. You might want to take your coat off and hang it up there. I have the heat on in the library. You won't need it. She didn't need to be told twice, so she unzipped her coat and hung it on the rack that sat behind the door. She'd missed it when she came in. The library's this way. He started off down the other side of the hall, disappearing around the corner quickly. Peyton hurried after him, going around the corner just as he made a left-hand turn. Afraid she was going to lose him, she power-walked the short distance to the turn. But as she looked around, he stood there, waiting. This is the library, he said with his hand on the door. He hadn't turned on any lights, and the hall was dark. She could work in the library, even if it was dark and gloomy, but she loved the natural light from the entryway and kind of wished the library would be like that, too. No sooner had she thought that than he opened the door, pushing it open and allowing her to go first. She stepped in, overcome. The library was in the shape of an octagon, three stories high. She'd noticed that there was some kind of structure sticking out of the top of the house, but the other time she'd come, it had been semi-dark, and today she'd been nervous and hadn't studied it. Now she knew. It was the library. The entire third story had floor-to-ceiling bookshelves and floor-to-ceiling windows the whole way around. She didn't count, but there must have been sixteen, since there were eight sides. A window and bookshelf in each side. The second story had a slightly bigger ledge, with bookshelves sticking out as well as lining the walls, and several tables scattered around. There were two circular staircases, one right beside her and one across the room that led up to the second story. A circular staircase on the opposite side led up to the third. She assumed there was another, above her, that she couldn't see. Bookshelves lined all the walls of the first floor where she stood, along with rows of bookshelves that filled up almost the entire floor. Several old but comfortable-looking chairs were scattered around. It was brightly lit from the afternoon sun that shone in from the west. Bryce struck the light switch behind her, right by the door, and it illuminated everything even more. All the bookshelves were filled to overflowing with books. Colorful bindings, although in several sections, they looked very old. Wow! I've never seen anything like this before! She'd grown up in South Carolina, moving to Indiana the year she graduated, so it wasn't like she'd never been out of North Dakota. But she had a feeling that this was not just uncommon for North Dakota, it was uncommon for the country. I guess it is something. 
For sure. Wow, all these books. I heard 6,000 volumes, but I don't think that's even close to being true. I don't think so either, but I guess since you're cataloging them, you can let me know. Suddenly, the task seemed greater than she could ever imagine. How in the world was she going to do this? Were these all here when you moved in? She asked, which wasn't exactly the question she wanted to ask, but she was trying to sort through her head to figure out what in the world she was going to do. Maybe she just wanted a little background on this, some kind of idea where she could begin. My great-grandfather on my dad's side built this house, and he included the library for my great-grandmother. She loved to read? Peyton asked the question, but it seemed obvious. Yeah, she loved to read, and he loved her. You've heard of the Rockefellers. They were the millionaires back then, but the Shakers weren't too far away. And my great-grandfather would spare no expense for his wife. Bryce's voice was softer and more inviting than it had been in any of their other interactions, like he admired and respected his great-grandparents. Wow, what a love. Yeah, it's that old-fashioned kind of love, the kind you really don't see around anymore. That line sounded almost bitter, but for once, they had something they could agree on. People in modern society didn't do things without a selfish motive. That included getting married. Her bitterness almost matched his. Maybe he was hurting. You've been burned. Hmm. It wasn't really an assent. I suppose I have the same as you. Nothing is ever the same as someone else. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have said anything. I don't know anything about you. Nor do you need to. It felt like that subject was closed, and she didn't push. She didn't need to know anything about him. He was right. It just felt like they finally might have a little bit of common ground. So all these books are from your great-grandmother? She could hardly believe they were. No, my grandmother loved to read just as much as her mother did. And my mom. I think that's why my dad fell in love with her. They both loved reading. I remember them spending a lot of time in here. This is where I would be if I lived here, Peyton said, and there was still awe in her voice as she looked around, noticing the intricate carvings on the pillars and the mural on the ceiling that she'd missed first glance. The gentle arch of the windows, the richness of the railing, and the dullness of the hardwood floor. Mom's from South Carolina, and she hated the cold. I don't think she ever did get used to it. She turned toward him, surprised. I'm from South Carolina as well. That's where I grew up until 12th grade when we moved to Indiana. Her memories there weren't very happy, since her mom had moved because she left her dad. Her family didn't really talk about it, and her dad died shortly after. It hadn't been officially ruled a suicide, since there was no note. But the gun was found at the scene, and the trajectory of the bullet seemed to indicate that. You don't like the North either, he observed. He surprised her, especially since his previous comments indicated he didn't want to have any personal type of interaction with her. I didn't at first, but it's grown on me. actually. To be honest, Indiana was okay, but I'm really loving North Dakota, although winter is brutal. It is. Reading makes it a little bit more bearable. He almost smiled as he said that. Maybe he would have. She wasn't sure how much the scars kept his face from moving. Maybe he was actually smiling this whole time, and they just made him look like he was glaring. She kind of doubted it, 
since there had been fire in his eyes when he'd been angry, but she supposed it was a possibility. But now, since he was talking to her, she said, I, I didn't realize this was going to be such a big job. It might take me a while. I explained to you that I have a business. I'm not in any big rush, but I have no idea what all is here. He stepped forward a bit and pointed down one of the rows. There's a desk back there, and there's a new computer sitting on it. That's what I was going to use to catalog them. He seemed to want her to walk down, so she started, and he followed her. The desk was huge, with a comfortable-looking chair behind it, and the computer looked typical to her. Although she had been using a laptop for so long, it was a little odd to see a desk computer. I have a buddy, lives in New York. He designed this for me. He said as he went around the desk, pulling some things out and setting them on top of it. Something that looked like a handheld scanner and a stack of square papers that had QR codes and looked like they had sticky backs. I haven't tried it, and the charger's in the drawer. He straightened, indicating the walls. There are wall sockets all around. Not as many as we might be used to in a regular house, though. I don't know how long this thing will work before it needs to be charged. He held it up. You should be able to scan the title of the book, although in some instances you may have to put it in manually. Then, scan the QR code. Then you pull off the sticky paper and put it on the inside cover of the book. That doesn't sound too hard. In fact, that's a lot easier than what I was thinking it was going to be. If you notice, all of the shelves are numbered, and once you scan the title and QR code, a form should come up for you to put the shelf number in. He held the scanner in his hand and looked around at the immensity of the library. I believe Mom did this 40 years ago or more, and she loosely based it on the Dewey Decimal System. I think there's a place for you to put that in as well if the book has a Dewey Decimal number on it, because some of the books that have been added since then don't. He went on to explain a little bit more, and then he turned his handheld scanner on and grabbed a book to demonstrate. Should I rearrange the books if they seem like they're in the wrong place? She asked. Yes, if they've been put back incorrectly, please move them to the proper spot. He added a few more directions, and even though she still felt overwhelmed, she felt like she would be able to cope. This was still going to be a bigger job than what she had anticipated, but at least she wasn't going to be handwriting titles or even typing them in. The scanner would make things a lot easier even if there were some older titles that she'd have to enter manually. Bryce held out the scanner. I guess that's about it. Do you think you're going to be okay? He stared down at her, his face just as closed off as it had been the entire time, almost as though he were afraid to open himself up because she might reject him. An odd feeling, since he had been the one who had been rejecting her. Still, she pushed it aside and nodded. I think I'll be fine. I was planning on working until midnight, and then I was going to head out. If you want, I can lock the door behind me, if you'll already be in bed. I'll be up. He didn't say anything else and didn't hang around to allow her to continue any kind of conversation. She had enough work in front of her to keep her busy for a very long time, so it was probably just as well although he left her with a lot of questions. Not just about the library, but about him. Obviously, he cared about it. Did he read the books? Did he spend a lot of time here? She could go on and on, but she figured it was quite possibly just a waste of time, since he didn't seem to be interested in having any type of relationship with her. And that was just as well. That's what she told herself anyway, trying to ignore the idea that the job in front of her seemed like it was going to last forever. Chapter 9 
In all of the 41 years we were married before my husband passed away, we never had a single fight. Karen Proctor, North Carolina Three weeks went by pretty much the same. Bryce made Peyton a sandwich around 9 o'clock that first Friday, not because he was a nice person or anything, but because he was making himself one and had some meat and bread left over. Right. He was totally kidding himself. There had been something compelling about the woman, a calmness or peace which seemed to emanate off of her, something he hadn't found in too many people. Sometimes an older person might have the aura she did, but he'd never been attracted to anyone like that. Curious might be more like it. She was serious about her job, but obviously loved books and admired the library, as most people would. But there was a quiet assurance about her, a feeling that she was rock solid, even though he also had the feeling that she had a deep sense of humor. Whatever it was, when he made himself his nightly sandwich, he'd thrown one together for her and taken it in along with a drink. She'd been pretty much where he left her, and he hadn't stayed long, even though he'd wanted to. Each Friday was the same. Now that he knew approximately what time she was getting there, he watched for her and met her at the door. He could have told her to just let herself in and go to the library, but he wanted to see her. Even if he was pretty sure she didn't want to see him, <laughs> who would? with the scars that twisted his face and mocked him every morning in the mirror. She hadn't taken him up on his offer for her to come at a different time and to bring her son. He wondered why, but didn't ask. Didn't really talk to her at all, other than a few grunts of greeting. He always waited to watch her leave from an upstairs window. As he waited for her today, he wondered why he was waiting. Why did he look forward to her coming? Why was there anticipation tightening his chest and causing his stomach to swirl? Wasn't the whole point of him moving to North Dakota to be alone? To get out of the spotlight and hide his face? But instead of doing that, here he was, not just showing his face to this woman, Peyton, but greeting her, deliberately. He stood in the kitchen and watched as she got out of her car. But instead of coming directly to the house, she opened the back door and pulled something out. Something that looked like a casserole. Had she brought food? His jaw ground together, and he stomped into the hall toward the door. He didn't like charity. Didn't like people looking at him and seeing his face and feeling pity. Even though he knew his line of reasoning wasn't quite accurate, he still hadn't quite gotten hold of his thinking as the front door opened. She smiled at him, like she always did, and greeted him before he could say anything. Good evening. I hope you had a wonderful week. Mine was busy. Seems like people were coming out of their winter hibernation, and I sold a lot of coffee and baked goods this week. She held up the pan she was carrying. On Saturdays, I make my famous berry French toast bake. I brought some for us to share tonight. It's best if you eat it right out of the oven, so I had it made. All we have to do is cook it for 20 minutes. Her cheerfulness and kind thoughtfulness made his anger evaporate. Most of it, anyway. He still felt anger at the universe for how he looked and what had happened to him. Anger at the unfairness of God who had taken everything he had away. Why had he given him so much just to take it all away? You can put it in the kitchen for now. I'll put it in the oven at 8.30. His gruff words and unwelcoming exterior did not seem to bother her in the least. She wasn't excessively cheerful, just sweetly calm. I'm not sure where the kitchen is, she said scrunching her face up and talking like she was admitting that her jeans hit a tail. 
He almost smiled at the thought, but stopped himself just in time. He opened the door wider, indicating she could come in. Then he pointed at the door to the dining room and assumed she could figure out the kitchen was on the other side. For all his looking forward to her coming, he could never get himself to act more welcoming, the way he felt. Maybe he just liked looking at her, liked seeing her peace and seeing how she was kind to him no matter what he did to her. Or he didn't know. But she never stopped trying to make small talk with him. He never engaged, even though he'd been rather good at striking up conversations with strangers and charming them back in the day. Certainly, he hadn't charmed anyone in quite a long time. She walked through the dining room, and he didn't follow her, moving instead to go to the exercise room he had outfitted. Changing his clothes in the small dressing room, he strapped on his boxing gloves. Boxing didn't really help him get rid of his pent-up aggression, but it did feel good to hit something. Just... He never really felt better about anything after he was done. Probably because his issues were more mental than physical. All mental. How many times had he heard that baseball was a mental game? He believed that himself. After the accident, after everything went down on social media, he allowed himself to dwell on the negative and... He probably looked pretty nasty to someone like Peyton, who seemed to have, if not exactly a cheerful view of the world, at least she didn't seem to be bothered by anything. Of course, he was the only thing around that might bother her. The thought didn't sit well with him. It wasn't the kind of person he thought he was going to grow up to be. He had an immense amount of talent, and he coupled that with a work ethic that few could match. And that was why he had been successful. Anyone would be upset to have it all come crashing down the way it had, through no fault of his own. Happenstance and lies. He finished working out and went to take a shower, seeing that he had hours to kill until it was time to eat. He wandered around the house, stared out the window, and finally decided he didn't have to wait until 8.30. He could cook it now, and they could eat earlier. There was nothing wrong with that. Actually, he wouldn't even take it into the library. He would have her come out, and they'd sit at the dining room table together. He had nodded, making his decision, and walked through the entryway into the dining room. He stopped short when he saw the table. <laughs> What were they going to do, sit at opposite ends? He'd need a megaphone to talk to her. Was he going to talk to her? <sighs> this was stupid. What was he thinking? He was actually going to eat with her? And that was dumb. Turning on his toes, he marched right back out of the dining room, frustrated with himself for forgetting for one second that he was who he was, what he was and that someone as nice and normal as Peyton might not be interested in spending time with him. It was a stupid thought. He had his hand on the banister and one foot on the stair when he stopped short again. She was the one who had brought the casserole. She was the one who had expected him to cook it so that they could eat it together. She was the one who knew they would need plates and silverware in order to eat a casserole. He'd always made sandwiches, something they could just hold and eat. He had never put anything on a plate. She was the one who had come up with that new idea. New for them. Slowly, he let his hand fall from the banister and his foot drop. It was funny how a few seconds could change a man's life forever. At the height of his career, and even before, he had more confidence than was healthy, probably, when it came to women. They chased him, and when he felt like it, he'd allowed himself to get caught. Never for long. He looked back on those days with a mixture of longing, but also revulsion. He hadn't been a very good man. 
He'd been successful beyond his wildest dreams, and he hadn't handled it well. He'd taken the adoration of fans, but even more than that, women, as his due. He assumed his friends liked him for him and not his success, or that his success was a part of him, intrinsically woven together so that he was it and it was him, and it wasn't something he could lose or have ripped away from him. But when his success went, when his handsomeness had been destroyed, when his integrity had been questioned and found grossly lacking, when he'd been tried on the fires of social media, branded guilty, and blacklisted, he hadn't had any friends who stayed, other than Dwight. Maybe, maybe what he admired so much about Peyton was something that was sincere and genuine something he wasn't used to seeing in the people around him. He turned, slowly, and walked back through the hall into the dining room, to the kitchen. He cooked her casserole, deciding they'd eat in the small breakfast nook, since that was more intimate than the large dining room. And he would try as hard as he could to take the chip off his shoulder while he ate with her to return some of the kindness to her that she showed to him. Nothing too deep or costly, just a casual friendliness to match hers. He could do it. Twenty minutes later, he took the casserole dish out of the oven and considered texting Peyton to let her know that it was done and she could come to the kitchen. He decided that he'd rather go get her, or maybe that just seemed more polite. A text seemed kind of impersonal, and he wanted her to know that he wasn't commanding her, that she was a guest, and he was treating her that way. That he was expecting her to take time off from her job, not expecting her to rush through a meal so she could get back to work. Opening the library door, he found her sitting on the floor, with the scanner beside her, several books lying there and one in her hand, as she carefully put the sticky paper in the front of the book on her lap. He noted that his dogs were lying, one behind her and one beside her, their heads on their paws, perking their ears at his entrance, but relaxing as soon as they figured out it was him. Since the first day when she hadn't backed down, they had been in love with her. He was a little bit annoyed because they were his dogs. They should love him. But if Peyton were around, both of them wanted to be with her. He supposed he understood. Animals were notorious for being able to sense people's feelings and their character, and his dogs had good sense. The French toast bake is ready. I thought we could eat it in the kitchen. Her head jerked up, and her mouth moved into an O. My goodness, I didn't hear you come in. Chapter 10 Communication Deborah Brantley from Delight, Arkansas You look like you're concentrating pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of concentration to stick one of these in the front of a book. Peyton laughed a little. <laughs> Actually, this is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, one of my favorites as a child. She ran a hand lovingly over what was obviously an old book, with the fancy binding and intricate title embossed in gold that older books often had. He loved the way she held it respectfully, like she loved it, like it was an honor to hold such a book and work with it. It made him smile, because that's the way his mother would treat her books. She carefully slid it in its spot on the bottom shelf, and then she stood, dusting her pants off and wiping her hands on the front of them. I'm in a pretty good place. It's going slow, but I don't think we thought it was going to be a one-day job. Definitely not. This is going to take forever. He looked around at all the books, wondering if she would really be here until they were all finished. Somehow, he doubted it. People didn't stay anymore. They didn't stick with things, especially not things that were hard or overwhelming. 
They wanted things to be easy so they could have a quick resolution, a little pat on the back, and move on. You might find this crazy, but I love it. She stood, stretching, and pulled the earbuds out of her ears, grabbing her phone out of her pocket and walking over, setting them on a chair with the rest of her stuff. I've been listening to audios, and I think I can do this job forever. It's like reading and working with books and filling my need to organize things all bundled up in one. There's a lot of organizing to do. You're going to go broke buying audios to listen to. Actually, I've been listening for free on YouTube. Say With Jay is a great channel, although the man who does it seems to have some connection to Idaho and ladies and underwear. I'm not sure exactly what. There was some gossip on the net about it. She shrugged. You know how that goes. She hit him right in the heart, and his smile slipped. He had thought it neat that she found a way to read books while she worked with books, but the idea that people believed rumors was one he was all too familiar with. I'll be in the kitchen, he said, turning abruptly and walking out, only getting a glimpse of the way her face had fallen and her brows had crinkled like she didn't understand why he had such strange, shifting moods. He was almost down the hall, feeling bad, when his dogs caught up to him, one on either side, and he heard footsteps behind him. He stopped and turned as he was about to walk into the dining room. She came down the hall, and he expected to see at least irritation on her face, if not outright anger but she walked just as smoothly as she always had, with a small smile on her face. Her brows rose when she saw that he stopped and looked at her. I'm sorry. That made her smile widen a little, but she lifted her shoulder, and there was no recognition entering her eyes, no acknowledgement that he owed her an apology. For what? she asked, tilting her head truly looking like she had no idea what he was talking about. It was tempting to say nothing and just turn away, but that would make him feel like he was taking advantage of her. She was being kind, and he was just repaying that with grumpiness. That wasn't the way life was supposed to work. Of course, he was the expert in knowing that life didn't work the way it was supposed to. I should have waited for you. It was childish of me to walk out in front of you. I just figured you were hungry, she grinned. I am too, but I know I made enough for both of us, so I wasn't too worried about it. I've shared my sandwiches with you. I've noticed that yours are bigger than mine. Seriously? She just raised her brows, like she wasn't going to argue with him but she knew she was right. Fine. Next time I make sandwiches, I'll bring a measuring tape in along with them. All right, you do that. She pursed her lips. I have witnesses. She looked at his dogs, as though they would know. The dogs are on my side. They're my dogs. Of course they are, she said sounding like she meant the exact opposite. Why did I call you to the kitchen? I could eat this entire thing myself. I thought that's what you were on the way to do. After all, you did leave me hanging in the library while you practically ran out. Fine, you go first. You know, when someone has a reputation like yours, and then all of a sudden you start letting people eat first, it makes people think like maybe you poison their food. She wrinkled her nose at him as she swept by, striding through the dining room and on into the kitchen, while he followed more slowly, bemused. Far from being scared off, she acted like she was comfortable with him, like his gruff exterior didn't mean anything. It was a bit of a new experience, since it had been so long since anyone, other than Dwight, had seen past the scars on his face and the attitude that went with them and took the time to see that there might be someone 
a human, under it after all. And not using pity or even compassion, but humor and just casual conversation, treating him like he was normal. He'd almost forgotten how good it felt. By the time he strode into the kitchen, she was opening up cupboard doors, and when he walked in, she threw over her shoulder, Where are you hiding your plates? Above the dishwasher, where normal people put them. Really? She said, sounding surprised that the plates might go by the dishwasher. But she didn't give him time to lecture her on proper plate placement in kitchen cupboards because she spoke immediately. This is a gorgeous kitchen. Everything you need right at your fingertips. She pulled two plates and paused with her hand on the cupboard door. Are these the ones you're using? They'll work just as good as any other ones will, he said, his voice rougher than it needed to be. It just seemed like such a normal thing to do, to stand in the kitchen getting plates out, getting ready to sit down to eat together. It had been so long since he'd done anything normal with another person. He carried the casserole over and set it down on the table. His phone buzzed in his pocket. Excuse me, he said, stepping a little bit away but not leaving the kitchen. He didn't know who it was, but unless it was an emergency, he'd call them back. He never got phone calls, except for his Aunt Carol in South Carolina, who was allowing the nanny and his daughter to stay at her house. She helped take care of Kendrick, but it was the nanny, Paisley, who was responsible for Kendrick during the day. When the nanny was off, Aunt Carol took care of her. He glanced at the phone. Not a business call. It was Aunt Carol. He swiped to turn the phone on, not particularly worried, since this was Carol's usual time to call him. Normally, she called after Kendrick was ready for bed. Hello? Bryce, how are you doing? Fine. If there were any problems, he would have called and told her. How is Kendrick? He asked, walking over to the other side of the kitchen and looking out the window. It was pitch dark, and he couldn't see anything except his reflection in the glass with the light in the kitchen on. If he turned it off, he'd be able to see stars shining brightly. He waited. She's fine, but she does miss her parents. She was asking about you again today, and poor Paisley doesn't know what to say. That you're raising her, and she is helping, and I'm busy, and she's better off there with you. When he had his accident, Kendrick had cried when she'd seen him, and had been too scared to go near. Her fear and rejection had cut deeply. Not that he blamed her, just that he knew that would be everyone's reaction to him, and he wasn't going to saddle his daughter with someone who looked like he did. Not to mention, everyone knew who he was. His name was famous on social media, or infamous. Someone who had been blacklisted as he had. Everyone knew his name, and everyone knew they needed to stay away from him, or they may get dragged down too. He did not want that for his daughter. I am going to see my grandchildren over spring break, and I'm sending Paisley and Kendrick out to see you. You'll need to do something with them. He knew his aunt didn't mean that quite the way it sounded. She loved Kendrick like her own daughter. She had been his mom's older sister, and they had been very close. It was just that his aunt didn't understand that he was staying away from his daughter as much as he could for her own protection, for her own good, for her own welfare. But if there wasn't going to be any place for them to stay in South Carolina, he wouldn't have a choice. If his aunt didn't have an agenda, trying to force him to take his daughter even though he knew that wasn't the best thing for her, she probably wouldn't mind would actually insist that Paisley stay there with Kendrick. Fine. Send me the dates of spring break 
and I'll buy tickets for Kendrick and Paisley. He needed to look at a calendar, but Easter wasn't too far away. A week or two. A man in his position didn't really need to care about the dates of holidays or celebrating, since he didn't celebrate anything anymore. It hurt his heart because he loved Kendrick. She didn't deserve what happened to her, didn't deserve to have a father who had his life ruined, not just by the accident, but because of the social media firestorm. It sucked him down, which he supposed up until that point in his life the media had loved him, more than he deserved, for sure. He supposed it was only right that they were the ones that took him down. They said a few more pleasantries before hanging up. He crossed his arms over his chest, thinking. Kendrick had been in North Dakota once or twice before, but never for long. He visited several times, but he tried to stay away. He didn't want her getting attached to him. He really wanted her thinking that her Aunt Carol and Uncle Raymond were her mom and dad. Or at least as close as one could get to the real thing, when things were so messed up. Who's Kendrick? He whirled around, having forgotten all about Peyton. He was so used to living alone, he hadn't given her a single thought. No one, he said gruffly, striding over to the table and grabbing a serving spoon that sat on the stove on his way by. She had set silverware down and had gotten them both glasses of water. Ice in his, no ice in hers. Interesting. Funny that he would notice a detail like that, but he tucked that away. If she didn't like ice, the next time he brought her a glass of water to drink, he'd make sure it didn't have any. Really? He was going to make sure he got her the water the way she wanted it, but he wasn't going to be kind to her when she asked him a question? He settled in the chair across from her. I guess I need to apologize again. No, I was being nosy, and you didn't want to tell me. There's nothing wrong with that. If that were true, I could have been kinder, but it's really not. He picked up the serving spoon and dished out two servings. That smells really good, he said as he set her plate in front of her. And I made sure to give you the bigger piece. She laughed recognizing his reference to their earlier conversation. He set the spatula down and paused. Even though he was angry at God, he usually did at least thank him for the food he ate. A habit formed in childhood, he supposed. His mom always said gratefulness keeps a man humble. Her brows twitched, and then she bowed her head. He supposed that meant saying the prayer was his job. He didn't mind, just, he felt like a hypocrite. What was that verse in the Bible about bitter waters and sweet couldn't come out of the same stream? Just like cursing and kindness shouldn't come out of the same mouth. And yet, he had been gruff and unkind pretty much the entire time she'd been in his house. He felt hypocritical talking to God now. Regardless, in the back of his mind, he remembered that God wanted to hear from him, whether or not he felt like he was worthy. The blood of Christ made him worthy, even if he didn't feel like it. So he said a short prayer, and she repeated his Amen. Guilt made his throat close as he looked at the food in front of him. Chapter 11 Good communication makes a marriage last. Both partners must be able to communicate their love, their fears, their worries, their feelings, and their dreams. Communication can help prevent unnecessary pain, doubts, and insecurities within the marriage. Communication is not always done verbally. It can be done with a note, a look, a touch, or even an action. It is important for both partners in a marriage to know how the other is feeling and what they may be struggling with inside. 
shared burdens, sorrows, and fears are lessened, just as shared love and joys are multiplied. Rebecca Hoke, Southern Ontario, Canada If Paisley and Kendrick were coming out to North Dakota, Peyton would be seeing them. There was no point in him hiding anything. So, before he took a bite, he said, Kendrick is my daughter. She lives in South Carolina with her nanny and my aunt, my mom's older sister. Peyton nodded, her mouth full. She swallowed and then said, If you don't take a bite of that, I'm going to start worrying again about whether or not there's poison in this. Or I'm going to think you don't like it. He grinned and dutifully picked up his fork, putting it in his mouth. It was delicious. She could not have been exaggerating when she mentioned she sold out of this every Saturday. It's edible, he said, giving her a look. Edible, she asked with her brows raised. I wouldn't want to have you get a big head. Everyone in town apparently loves it. Do you really need me as your next conquest? Last conquest, she said, grinning. He swallowed all of his second bite before answering. I guess I'm a willing conquest, because this is pretty amazing. He loved the way her eyes shone, not surprised, but just with a radiant happiness that was unfeigned. So you have a daughter, she said, as though the conversation had not been interrupted by him giving a compliment on her cooking. Yeah. And she doesn't live with you? No. She doesn't live with her mom? He figured it was going to be twenty questions unless he sucked it up and gave her the information she wanted. Of course, he could just tell her to buzz off, but he found he really didn't want to. Interesting that she'd knock down the walls that he had erected to keep people at a safe, arm's-length distance. Her mom and I split when she was little. Her mom raised her for a while, a few years, but had some drug addiction issues and was in and out of rehab. I ended up with custody of Kendrick. I needed to hire a full-time nanny because of my job. It didn't leave a whole lot of free time during the season. He could have spent more time with his daughter than he did. He'd been pretty selfish full of himself, egocentric, and he hadn't wanted to be tied down with a kid. He was ashamed of the person that he'd been and didn't want to talk about it. Maybe that was one good thing that had come out of the accident. He'd never really thought of it before, but it had changed him for sure. I see. So I guess I don't understand why she's with the nanny now. Because of this, he said, pointing to his face like it was obvious. She narrowed her eyes, tilting her head and furrowing her brows. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Would you want to have a dad with a face like this? I guess I wouldn't care what your face looked like if you were my dad. You maybe don't understand what it's like in today's age of social media. Everybody would know what I look like, her friends, people at school, everyone. She would be embarrassed and ashamed of me. I guess if you taught her to be embarrassed and ashamed, that's how she'd feel. But you can teach her a better way. Peyton's voice still held uncertainty, like she couldn't quite believe she was even arguing with him about something like this. Like it was obvious that his daughter would love him. It's easy for someone like you to say, someone perfect. Her brows lifted at that, and she opened and closed her mouth before she narrowed her eyes. It was the first time she had shown herself to be anything more than easygoing since he'd practically run her off of his property. Had he made her angry again? I suppose it's true that I've never walked in your shoes but I have been insulted and belittled, and my son has heard that. 
and I can tell you, from the time he was young, I taught him that being unkind to people was wrong. And I try to model that in my life. She lifted her shoulder. I'll be disappointed if he doesn't live that out in his own life. But there comes a point in time where I'm going to have to let my actions speak for themselves and give him the choice. But until he leaves my home, he's going to be kind to people, no matter what they look like. Bryce pressed his lips together, his fork suspended in midair. He wasn't entirely sure she was right, but what she said made a lot of sense. Wasn't it the job of parents to direct how their children thought? He wasn't just supposed to lie back and let his daughter develop her ideas from what the rest of the world said. He was to be proactive. But his was a special case. There weren't a whole lot of people who looked the way he did, and his daughter shouldn't have to live with that. I'm doing this for her own good. She's getting good instruction from Aunt Carol, and Paisley is an excellent nanny. She came highly recommended. I know they're teaching my daughter everything she needs to know. Okay, Peyton said, shrugging her shoulders. Like it didn't matter whether he agreed with her or not. Okay, but, he said, figuring he probably was asking for trouble. But it was weird that she just agreed. But I don't want to argue. We're not arguing. We're discussing it. I just don't like to. He narrowed his eyes at her. You mean you don't like to give your opinion? I just did, but you don't have to agree with me. So you'd rather keep the peace than put your opinion out there, even though it might be the right one? I hope it's biblical, but yeah. I guess sometimes I would just rather everything go smoothly than for us to have a big argument about it. She's your daughter, and you get to do what you want to with her, even if I don't agree. So you don't agree? No. She's yours. God didn't give her to Aunt Carol. He didn't give her to Paisley. And I'm not saying that you can't have a nanny. If your job takes you away and you don't have someone to help you, you might need her. But what are you doing that you can't take care of your daughter? She lifted her face and looked him in the eye with that last question, and it hit him right between the eyebrows. She was right. What was he doing? Nothing. He wasn't doing anything that he couldn't have his daughter here taking care of her himself. The weather in South Carolina is a lot nicer than it is in North Dakota. Are you serious? You're going to use the weather as an excuse? She sounded incredulous. And then she laughed. <laughs> but you're right. The weather in South Carolina is a lot nicer. In the winter, anyway. It gets pretty hot in the summer. He couldn't disagree with her. And if you think the weather is so much nicer in South Carolina, why don't you move down there? He wanted to tell her to keep her nose in her own business, but he was the one who brought the subject up. Just because she was making too much sense and he didn't like it didn't mean that he could shut her down now, since he was the one who'd invited her to speak. Even if he hadn't, Surely he could take a little disagreement? His decision should hold up under scrutiny. But he found he didn't have a good argument, other than he wanted to live in North Dakota. So he should bring his daughter here. I don't know, he finally said, because there wasn't anything else to say. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you feel bad. No, I was the one who wanted to know what your argument was. When he talked to Peyton, he forgot he looked terrible, forgot about the scars, and forgot that he wasn't normal. She just acted like he was a regular person. You don't know who I am? He asked, realizing she didn't seem to. 
You're Bryce Shaker. His name rolled easily off her tongue. Bryce Shaker, the baseball player. You were a baseball player. She tapped her fork on her plate. I might have heard that. She grinned. Were you any good? Some people said I was. And then I had an accident. This happened. He pointed to his face, making a circular motion around it. Then someone hacked my social media account and put a racial slur on it. The media heaped on and I was canceled. There was no way with the physical issues I had to overcome, with that on top of that, that I would ever get back to where I was. So I retired. That's what it was called, but I guess I quit. Everyone has to have a stopping point. Professional sports are notorious for young retirement ages, although baseball is a little more long-lived than some of the other sports, like football. She spoke mildly, like he hadn't just poured out his life. He admired her even keel, but maybe he wanted her to be a little shocked and angry that he had been so grossly mistreated. Most of the time, people get to choose their stopping point. I didn't. No, you didn't. God did. He just stared at her, wanting to argue, but knowing that she was absolutely correct. He could blame other people all he wanted to, but they were not in control of the universe. God was. She gave him a gentle smile. We like to think we choose. And God does give us free choice about some things. But there are things in life that he gives us that we can't get out of. Everything that happens, that God allows to happen, is designed to make us better. Unfortunately, all too often we decide to get bitter. Was that a slam? He asked, and he admitted there was some anger in his tone. He wanted to direct it at her. Not at you. I was just thinking of myself and my divorce. My husband found someone else, like it happens, right? And he walked out. The funny thing was, we lived in the house with his mother. When he left, he left me and his son living with her. She was pretty angry at me. I guess she thought it was my fault. That's ridiculous. Was it? I wondered. After all, he blames me, said that it was my fault that he had to go find someone else. If I had known there were any problems, if he would have talked to me about them, I would have loved to try to work through them. That's just a line people use when they don't want to take the blame for their own actions. Yeah, I figured that out eventually, but I was still bitter and angry. Why did that happen to me? Why my marriage? My husband? I wanted to celebrate a golden anniversary. I wanted to have a stable home for my son. And I wanted more children. I never intended to raise an only child. I wanted him to have siblings. To have a big, happy, fun family where we laugh and play and love. There was no bitterness or anger in her voice. And he kept listening wanting to know what changed to make her not be angry that her dreams had been shot down by some jerk who didn't appreciate what he had, how she got over it. I was angry at God for letting it happen. I trusted my husband, and I was the best wife I could possibly be. I was constantly trying to be kind and forgiving and nice. She huffed. <laughs> nice didn't seem to get me anywhere. And I could look around at marriages where the wife was really terrible, commanding and bossy and derogatory and never happy, and the husband patiently put up with her. Some of those marriages are still together. But my husband left. I can look around at all that unfairness and just be angry. Life isn't fair. It stinks. Well, yeah. 
But then I just realized that I could have that attitude, or I could just look at every day as a gift. Do I want to waste my gift being unhappy and miserable? Or should I accept the things I can't change? Realize there's a lot of good and just focus on that. You know, the Bible says to focus on things that are beautiful, just, good, virtuous, and praiseworthy. That's the conclusion he'd been coming to, that he'd allowed his negativity to rule his life, to run it, to change him into someone he didn't like. Chapter 12 What's made my marriage last 41 years is making each other laugh nearly every day. Rosemarie, Annadale, Virginia And sure enough, the next words out of Peyton's mouth were, I didn't like who I was becoming. I hated my mother-in-law because she made snide comments about how I couldn't keep a man. She'd invite my husband and his girlfriend over to eat, which was very awkward. You should have moved out. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't afford to. I, I had a young son and no job. The house at least was paid for, but yeah. That's what I worked toward, saving up enough money that I could move somewhere and start a little business of my own. I finally saved enough, and there was the store available in Sweetwater, and I thought I could give it a shot. I see. I understand now why you said what you did when you first came here, about how you had to make sure your business was successful. Yeah, everything hinges on that. I mean, I guess I could go back and live with my former mother-in-law, but I'm guessing, although I could be wrong, my ex has probably moved his new girlfriend in. Ouch. Yeah, I promised not to contest the divorce if I was allowed to live in the house as long as I wanted to. We got that in writing, and he actually kept his word on that. Once they break their word, they'll do it again and again. He could write the book on people who made promises they didn't keep, who weren't loyal, and who did what was best for themselves, not caring about what they said they'd do. She had told the story so easily, without deep emotion and without anger or bitterness. He admired that, even as he was attracted to it. She had a way about her that made him feel like she was an anchor, unmovable. She'd stand by someone forever. So, I started looking at my divorce as providing lessons God wanted to teach me. That's smart. He should do that. The anger and the bitterness tried to rise up in his chest, and he worked on pushing it down, even while he listened to her. Did you find any? He asked. His plate was empty, his fork lay on the table, but he didn't think of cutting their conversation short. A ton. Her words were sure like there was no doubt in her mind that God had lessons to teach her, and it wasn't hard to find them. It grew my faith, too. I knew I couldn't depend on people, on men, but I could depend on God. Not all men are like that, he said, although he said it with a little bit of guilt, because there was a time in his life where he wasn't a man of character. He still had to work on doing the right thing. No, and I suppose that's a lesson I learned, or something similar. Humanity is broken. There isn't anyone who's going to be perfect all the time. You're never going to look around and find that perfect person, including yourself. We are all sinful. We all have areas that we're working on. We all sin. Some people just do it bigger than others. <laughs> yeah, that's true, and you can't look around with a negative attitude. But I figured out that we can't expect people to do things, to behave a certain way, because we're just setting ourselves up for disappointment and failure. 
we can expect good things for them, so we're not looking at them through rose-colored glasses, but we want good things for them. We cheer them on when they do well, but we can't expect good things from them. Still, don't you get hurt when they don't do those good things you expect when they flop? I think if you're going to get married, you need to find someone who knows how to keep their word, who doesn't believe in divorce. But you just have to understand that you can't expect perfection out of anyone around you any more than they can expect perfection out of you. Because you're just going to be disappointed in each other. You just need to live life, ready to offer grace. It will be a daily, hourly offering. Some things were just too big to overlook. He wanted her to see that. If your husband cheated on you and apologized and wanted to come back, would you have taken him? He didn't know why he was playing devil's advocate, and she kind of smiled like she knew he was asking her a question that almost couldn't be answered. I don't think so. I think once the vows are broken, that's it. Although, I do know people who have put their marriages back together, and some people who just know that their husband can't be faithful and they stay with him anyway. I admire people like that, but I don't think I would want to be one, mostly because I wouldn't want that example for my son. Yeah, he said, thinking about his daughter and her examples. He hadn't been the best example for her. He hadn't cheated on anyone, but he hadn't handled the trial God had given him very well either. How old is your daughter? Peyton asked as she scraped the last of the crumbs off her plate. She's ten, he said. Owen is going to be thirteen soon. They're pretty close in age. You can bring him here while you work. The offer still stands. I guess you have your reasons for not. He hoped it wasn't because he had been so mean and grumpy. He hadn't meant to be like that and keep her son away. He's been staying overnight at one of his coach's houses so he can go to baseball practice on Saturday mornings. That's why I haven't brought him on Friday nights. I was going to come on Mondays, but I haven't been able to make it out because I've been doing inventory in my store so I'll be able to leave it a little easier without the ladies having to do any extra work. You were planning on coming out on Mondays? I was hoping to. He wasn't sure where the next words came from, but before he knew it, his mouth was opening and he said, How would you guys like to eat Easter dinner with us? The offer was so out of the blue, her mouth dropped open and her eyes bugged out. I can see I shocked you. I... it was a dumb idea. What was he thinking? He had never invited company to his house, ever. Not here in North Dakota. And before, he'd been single with a demanding baseball career. He didn't entertain people. I'm sorry, you just surprised me. But I think that would be nice. Owen and Kendrick can get to know each other. She glanced at the clock on the wall and said, Oh! She pushed back from the table. I didn't realize how late it was. I'd better get back to work. That was a whole hour. I did not mean to take that long. Relax. I'm the one who suggested we eat out here in the kitchen. And thanks for talking. He wanted to thank her for the wisdom she'd shared. It had been coinciding with what he had been learning and thinking and it had shifted his mind, giving him the idea that he needed to start going in a different direction. The first thing he needed to do was take control of his thoughts. That would completely change his life, if he could do it. Chapter 13 According to my husband of 33 years, it's working opposite schedules, so we're not together long enough to fight. Lisa from New Jersey
Saturday morning, Peyton's bake shop was the busiest it had ever been. The rush started at 6 a.m. and didn't let up. She had decided to bake a second breakfast dish, one that was more savory, a tater tot bake. And by 8 a.m., she was wishing she had four casseroles of it rather than just two, since the first one was already gone, and the second one was disappearing faster than she had dreamed. <laughs> I'm selling more food than I am books. She laughed with Shasta when Shasta came in with Sadie before she headed to work at the garage. That's great. You should have baked goods, too. I know I would take something with me to go, Sadie said as she grabbed the plate that Peyton had handed her. Shasta and Sadie went to sit down, and Peyton checked out three more people before she had a chance to go over and sit down with them. Usually they had a leisurely breakfast together, with Peyton just occasionally getting up and helping customers, but Peyton supposed she couldn't complain. She would much rather be busy than wondering how she was going to pay her bills. How are things working out with the peacemakers helping you? Shasta asked as Peyton slipped back into her seat yet again. They seem to be enjoying it, Peyton said, surprise coloring her tone. She would have thought the peacemakers would have spent a day or two in the shop, then decided they wanted to go back to the church basement. They say they like getting out. It's just Fridays, right? Yeah, I guess I haven't had them that much. I usually cut out about lunchtime on Friday, although several times I've gone earlier. And then you work until nine? Shasta asked, like that was a terribly long workday. I actually work until midnight, but it's not really work. She tried to keep the dreamy quality out of her voice, because while her job was extremely easy, just scanning books and checking to make sure the title was right, and putting the scan sticker in the front, maybe it would be monotonous. Eventually. But Bryce had captured her imagination. Or maybe not imagination just her thought life. It was hard to get her brain to concentrate on anything else. While she was there, she listened for his footsteps, hoped he would come in with a sandwich or a drink, or just to let her know he was going outside. Sometimes he popped in to grab the dogs and take them out for their evening walk. And then, just the night before, she'd brought the berry French toast bake, thinking that she might get to spend a little extra time with him, since it needed to be cooked. She'd been disappointed when he said he would cook it. But he invited her to the kitchen to eat. She hadn't been expecting that, and had loved the time together. There was something intriguing about him, something tragic, but also the idea of fortitude and strength. Like there was character developing, and it was a beautiful thing to see. Plus, every time she was around him, there was some kind of tingling excitement that made her feel more alive than she had in a long time. I've never seen Bryce Shaker. What does he look like? Sadie asked casually, putting a bite of the casserole in her mouth and then punctuating her next statement with her fork. And by the way, this is amazing. Definitely make this one again. Peyton laughed, but then she sobered. How did she describe Bryce? Did she gloss over the scars? Not even mention them? It felt like dwelling on the negative if she made sure everyone knew. But if she didn't even mention them, they would be surprised when they actually did see him. And Peyton had a feeling that Bryce was working on the issues that he had, and that maybe he would be back out in society soon. She supposed it was a little egotistical of her to think that she had anything to do with his changing personality. She hoped she did. Her divorce wasn't anything like the accident and canceling he'd been through. She hadn't lost what he had, because she hadn't had anything to begin with but she did understand how hard it could be, and she hoped that some of the lessons that she learned had been a blessing to him. But 
Was it too much for her to think that maybe he felt some of the same shimmering attraction that she did? She mostly thought she was imagining things, but every once in a while, he did something that made her feel like maybe she wasn't. The way he came into the library more often than he needed to, the way his gaze lingered on hers when they spoke, the way he didn't seem to want to leave, the way he looked at his dogs as they lay at her side while she worked. <sighs> that was so silly. She wasn't a little girl anymore with the luxury to engage in silly daydreams. He was in an accident. She finally began, deciding to answer honestly, and describe his scars as part of his features, the way she would any feature that someone had. I think he's very self-conscious about the scars that he has on his face from it. But he's tall, with broad shoulders, and his hair is a couple shades darker than mine, and he has really gorgeous blue eyes. Really gorgeous? Shasta asked, her fork suspended in midair as her brows went way up. Yeah, they're pretty. Whoa, girlfriend, you went from really gorgeous to pretty. What's up? Sadie asked and Peyton wished they weren't both seated across the table from her so she wouldn't feel like they were ganging up on her now, staring at her across their plates, both of them with expressions on their faces that said they expected answers. I don't know. They're just different. I've never really seen eyes that color before. Or maybe she'd never noticed anyone's eyes like she did his or had never felt tingles going down her backbone when anyone else's eyes landed on hers, the way she did with Bryce. Blue eyes are blue eyes, Shasta said, her voice holding confidence and banality. Yeah, they probably are, Peyton agreed, not wanting to argue about it. You capitulated way too easily, Sadie accused her. She shrugged. She could not explain it and wasn't sure she wanted to. We're trying to get to the bottom of this. Do you or don't you have a crush on Bryce? Peyton froze. Did she? Did she want to admit it? Her instinct was to hide it, to deny it, because she didn't want to have a crush on anyone. She'd been married. She'd hated it. He cheated and her entire life had been completely trashed. She did not want to go through that again. But just because she had a crush on someone didn't mean they were getting married the next day. I don't think I have a crush on him. I do find him attractive and mysterious. One woman can resist a man who is a mystery. Yeah, those tall, dark, and handsome types. Only he's not dark. His hair is probably shady brown. And those blue eyes. Peyton wanted to slap her hand over her mouth. She shouldn't have mentioned the eyes again. Someone is really hung up on these eyes. I feel like I need to go drive out and see what you're talking about. Peyton shook her head. Just ignore me. I don't even like blue eyes. Her ex had blue eyes, and she never thought she'd fall for a pair of baby blues again. She wasn't falling. But you're admitting you're attracted to him. Shasta jumped on that immediately. No. Peyton spoke immediately. Then she relented. Maybe. I don't know. It doesn't matter. There's never going to be anything between us. I do find him interesting, and I have found myself thinking about him way more than I should be. But that doesn't mean anything. Once I'm done with the library, I'll never be out there again. Okay, Shasta said, like she didn't really believe her, but she was going to let it go for now. Nolt and I were wondering if you and Owen wanted to come to our house for Easter dinner after church. Oh boy. After the conversation they just had, they were going to flip when she said this. Bryce invited Owen and I out to his house for Easter dinner, so I think we're going to do that. Oh, yeah, 
she's not falling for him. Shasta looked at Sadie, and they rolled their eyes. His daughter's coming. She's just a little bit younger than Owen. I can work Saturday night after we're done here, and our kids can play together. That's all. So he's cooking, Sadie asked, and then her eyes got big. You mean he cooks too? She asked, since everyone knew a woman couldn't resist a man who cooks. I... I don't know, Peyton said. I assume so, since he invited me out for dinner. But I've never seen him make anything but sandwiches. You guys have eaten together, Peyton nodded. In the kitchen together. Yeah, yesterday we did. Did that mean something special? She kind of felt that way at the time, but it was interesting that her friends read that into it too. So you're out there, supposedly working, but instead you guys are hanging out in the kitchen eating together? Sadie said, laughter in her voice, but her intelligent eyes weren't missing anything. I spend most of my time working, but I'm out there for such long hours, I have to eat. You don't pack a lunch? I did the first day, but he brought me a sandwich, so I haven't been, because I didn't want to pack a lunch and waste either that or the sandwich he made me. He's been making you sandwiches, Shasta began, exchanging a glance with Sadie. Are you going to admit that there's something more going on than just you being in the library filing books? Peyton shook her head. I don't want there to be anything more. I won't allow there to be anything more. I told you, I like him. I'm curious about him. I'm definitely intrigued, and I do think he's a good man. I think he went through a hard time, and it made him angry and bitter, and he's realizing now that's not the way he wants to be. So, yeah, that's interesting to me but I'm not looking for another relationship. It's not going to happen. She was as firm as she could be, but she was also being honest. Because there was something about Bryce that was different than other men she knew. Something that pulled her toward him in a way she couldn't explain. She definitely didn't mind spending time with him and wouldn't mind spending more. The bell over the door rang as someone walked in, and she pushed out of her seat. Are we ever going to meet him? Sadie asked as she stood. I don't know. Maybe. I think he'll start getting out soon. Something told her that he just needed some time to pull away and heal. That his healing was almost complete, and just as soon as he got his mind going in the right direction, then she bet he would be out. Maybe he'll go to one of Owen's baseball games? That's his sport, right? Yeah, he used to be a professional player. She closed her mouth. But he hasn't really said much of anything about that, and I haven't asked him. Why not? I don't know. I guess I just didn't think he'd be interested in watching some kid he doesn't even know. Not to mention, he didn't go out at all. Yet. You should. It would be good for him to get out, and it might be good for you. It definitely would be good for Owen to have someone cheering him on. Maybe after his daughter leaves, Peyton said, shrugging her shoulders. She didn't want to ask a man she barely knew to come see her son play, even if baseball was his sport. Or maybe she just needed to think about it and see if she thought that was a good idea because part of her really loved the idea of spending more time with him, especially since he would be so knowledgeable. It would be fun to sit beside him again and listen to his thoughts. There was something really fascinating about listening to someone talk about something they were good at and experiencing it with them. She'd have to think about it, she decided as she waved to her friends and walked away from the table heading behind the counter and greeting the couple that had walked in. Actually, the more she thought about him, the more she loved that idea. 
Chapter 14 Lots of forgiveness for big and little things. Lots of laughs and kisses. Barb Stillings Monday morning, Bryce was just coming back from going on a run with his dogs when two cars pulled into the spot in front of his house. The first one he recognized easily as he slowed to a walk, putting his hands behind his head and trying to get his breathing under control. Sweat dripped down his temple, and the front of his T-shirt was wet with it. He had needed to take a pretty hard run, just trying to get the thoughts and ideas that were jumbled in his head straightened out. Running usually helped him clear his brain. Some people hated it, but once he pushed through the initial reluctance and the natural laziness of his body, he found that the steady stomping of his feet on the ground, the increased heart rate and blood flow, and the change of scenery, with nothing in his ears but the whistling of the wind, helped him focus. Today, he got nothing figured out. Nothing except all his mind wanted to do was think about Peyton. Her easygoing personality under which lay an ironclad determination to do the right thing. He'd figured that out while she was sitting in the kitchen talking about her divorce. And how she wasn't going to be bitter and angry. How she wanted the best for her son and how she had needed to change her thoughts the courage it had taken for her to pull up from the place where everything was familiar, where she had friends and neighbors and relatives, and move to a place where she knew no one, just because she felt like that was the right thing for her child. He loved that she put her son above herself, that she wasn't living selfishly, figuring out what she wanted and finding herself. She reminded him of something he had learned when he was much, much younger and much less cynical. Sometimes, in order to find oneself, one has to lose oneself in serving others. Peyton hadn't needed to say that. She was living it. He reached the cars, recognizing the first car as Pam, the lady who normally made his meals for the week. Typically, she wasn't here this early on Monday, but he seemed to recall that she'd mentioned she was taking a break from making his meals while she went to Duluth to visit family over Easter vacation. He hadn't worried about it too much because in the next breath she'd said that she would find a replacement for him, training them, telling them everything they needed to know, saving him from having to cook for himself or make himself uncomfortable by going out and finding someone. But the second car looked a little familiar, too. He had his breathing under control when Charlene stepped out. He had seen Charlene several times before. She was the reason Peyton was working for him now. A few weeks ago, he might have been upset with Charlene, since she'd sent Peyton out without a phone call or any kind of warning. He and Peyton hadn't had the best start, and he found that odd especially considering Peyton was so easygoing. But that first meeting, she'd been angry. He knew now anger wasn't an emotion she normally felt, and it was interesting that he managed to elicit it from her after talking to her for barely five minutes. Good morning, Bryce, Pam said, stopping as she opened the trunk of her car and looked at him as he walked toward her. Good morning, Miss Pam. Miss Charlene? He nodded at Charlene as she walked up to the car. Good morning. Good morning, the ladies said together. Pam said, I told you I would take care of everything, and Miss Charlene and the other peacemakers ladies are going to make sure you don't starve to death while I'm gone. Uh, appreciate that. He could make sandwiches, but he wasn't sure he could do too much else. He'd never had to. When he was younger, he just ordered takeout, fast food, or gone out to eat. Let me help you carry that stuff in, he said. He wasn't usually out when she came in, and honestly, he usually tried to avoid any human interaction. Something about Peyton had caused him to... He wasn't even sure. 
made me feel like he was ready to step out into the jungle of humanity again. There was just something about her steady personality, her easy acceptance of him, her refusal to get offended when he was gruff or short or even unkind, how she just let whatever he did roll off her back. It was almost like, after those first two times of her getting angry at him, she'd made a choice to accept him and like him no matter what. He couldn't imagine anyone actually doing something like that, but it's what it felt like. Like she was living out the command of Jesus, but she didn't make it look hard or onerous, just natural. He grabbed some bags of stuff and walked into the house with Pam and Charlene trailing behind, carrying a few odds and ends. He typically ordered his groceries, and Pam picked them up for him, adding what she needed to make his meals to his order at the store. As he set the stuff down on the counter, Pam said, I've been hearing that there's been someone out here at your house, and I wasn't sure whether you were feeding her. I brought some extra cold cuts just in case. You always give me extra money, and I thought that might be something you might need. I know you like your sandwiches in the evening. Pam knew his habits as well as anyone. She'd been sweet and kind and a perfect find. He would miss her. Charlene seemed like she was quite capable, and he wasn't worried. Thank you. I've actually been making sandwiches for her. You know me pretty well. Pam nodded, her permed hair not moving but sticking in tight curls to her head. I didn't tell you, but my daughter is coming this week. She'll be here for two weeks. Give me a list of the things that she likes, and I'll make sure that she has plenty of options. Charlene spoke like the thing she said didn't twist Bryce's insides. He didn't know what his daughter liked. He had no idea. He also didn't know how much she usually ate. He didn't know her at all. Peyton's words came back to him as he stood there, saying how her son was her responsibility and she would do the best she could for him. He hadn't done what he should have done for his daughter. Hadn't been a very good dad. Had been a terrible parent. Sure, he hadn't been addicted to drugs or in and out of rehab like Kendrick's mom, but he treated her like a possession and not a person. He'd wanted to protect her from teasing and any hardship she'd face because of him being infamous, but he couldn't blame everything on his accident and cancel culture since he hadn't spent that much time with her before. He really had tried to justify what he had done by saying she was better off without him. The more he thought about it, the more he figured Peyton was probably right. Although, bringing his daughter here, having her around him, was going to require some sacrifice and even pain on his part. Pain because people were going to see him. They were going to make fun of him. They were going to tease her about him. He would see Kendrick's pain, and that would hurt him the most. He didn't want his kid to be ashamed of him. He wanted his child to be proud of her parent. I'll have to make a list and get back to you. He'd have to call his daughter and ask. Also, I know that groceries are normally delivered on Monday, but I'm having some people over for Easter dinner, and I'd like it if you could pick up the things I order and bring them out. Pam would have agreed readily, but Charlene wasn't quite as easygoing. Her eyes narrowed. I'm sorry. Fridays are very busy for me, and Saturday Owen has a baseball game, and I want to see it. He jerked his head up, wanting to ask about the other three days of the week, but he didn't. Why couldn't he pick up his own groceries? He didn't need Charlene to do it for him. He wouldn't even have considered it a couple of weeks ago and her refusal might have made him angry. That's fine. Come to think of it, I'll get them. Was it just his imagination, or did Charlene look a little satisfied? Like she got him to do exactly what she was hoping he would. He wasn't sure. 
The ladies left soon after, and he showered and changed, going to his office and sitting down at his computer. He had some investments he needed to check, and he needed to talk about a few things with his accountant and discuss something with one of his business partners. With everything he was involved in, he was a silent partner, not wanting to show his face, knowing that if he did, the canceling that he'd been through could possibly rub off on his business and cause it to lose money or even go out of business. Lots of good people would lose their jobs if that happened, so he stepped back, which suited him just fine, since he was ashamed of his face anyway. Although maybe that was just one of the trials God had for him to go through, to make him stronger, to not be afraid of what other people thought, to not need the approval of everyone before he made a move. Also, to understand, sometimes people just talked about things they had never seen before that surprised them or were unusual. When they were talking good things about him, when he was an unusually good baseball player, their talking about him hadn't bothered him. But now that he was an unusually scarred man, the comments did. Both were human nature. Those thoughts chased each other around in his head, and he had a hard time concentrating on his work until he saw Peyton's car pull up. She hadn't said she was going to be here today, but he had been hoping. He wasn't doing anything he couldn't quit, so he shoved back away from his desk, ran a hand over his face, wishing it were different, and then straightened his back. She hadn't seemed to be bothered by it, and it wasn't like they were anything more than friends anyway. Friends accepted flaws in each other and overlooked them. That's what friends did. She had already knocked on the door and was pushing it open by the time he got to the foyer. Oh, hello, Bryce. I thought maybe you weren't coming to the door. He wouldn't miss it. Did you have a good weekend? It wasn't just small talk for him. He was truly curious what she had done all weekend. It had been different than his in every way, probably. I did. We're closed on Sundays, and I try to spend that day with Owen. In the morning, of course, we went to church. Of course. He hadn't even thought about going to church for a decade or longer. But over this weekend, the thought had crossed his mind. He'd been more shocked than anything, but he hadn't gone. Still, he found his Bible and opened it up to a random spot and found himself reading far longer than he intended. Maybe he would go to church again soon. Peyton had continued to talk, and now she was saying, and I have all the inventory accomplished that I wanted to at the bookstore, so I should be good there for a while. I thought I'd come out today to get ahead a little, since I know your daughter's coming. I know we talked about our children playing together, but just in case you want to spend some time alone with her and not be bothered by having me here, I thought I'd get in a little extra time. Her smile was sweet, her eyes bright, her cheeks looking rosy and fresh. She just looked natural and calm, and just standing beside her helped him feel that way too. No, you're welcome to come out as much as you want to. In fact, I was hoping you might come out more, with Owen being off school. Oh, we'll have to think about that. He'd be fine here, I'm sure. I feel like it goes without saying, but he's welcome to roam the grounds and play with whatever. I don't have much in the way of anything for kids. There are a couple of bicycles in the shed and maybe a ball or two. Maybe even a skateboard. I'd have to look, but he's welcome to any of it. Thanks. I'll remember that. He stood, knowing he was staring at her, unable to think of anything else to say. He wanted her to stay, wanted to keep talking to her, didn't want her to walk away from him and didn't want their time together to end. He racked his brain for something to say, and finally he said, I invited you over for Easter dinner, but my cook is leaving. I have someone to take her place, 
but I can't ask her for anything special, so I guess I'm going to be cooking myself. We don't have to come if it's too much trouble. No. That was not what he was trying to say at all. I just wanted to warn you that it might not be the best thing you've ever eaten. Let me bring something. You could stay overnight on Saturday and cook it in my kitchen. He wanted her to. Wanted her in his house, in his kitchen, with him. She was so different from the other women he'd known, since he'd never really cared whether they stayed or left, didn't really enjoy their company, found their conversation dull and uninspiring. Actually, as he thought about it, maybe it was him that was dull and uninspiring, because looking back, his main concern had always been about himself. How was he coming off? What was she thinking about him? What could he do differently to make himself look good? Was she impressed with what he was doing? Was she entertained by his conversation? He never stopped to really pay attention to the woman he was with, to listen to her, to be entertained by her, to smile and let her know he enjoyed being with her to dig a little deeper and let her know he wanted to know more. That had probably been a character issue on his part, but maybe it also had to do with interest. Because he couldn't stop himself from wondering about Peyton. Of course, he wanted her to listen to what he was saying and be impressed with what he did and see him for who he was. But interestingly, he wanted to do the exact same back to her wanted her to know that he cared about her and was interested in what she said and was impressed by what she did. That was a first for him. Maybe it was the first time he'd set aside his own self-interest and selfishness, his tendency to focus on himself and how he was presenting himself to the world, to lose himself, set himself aside, in order to be interested in lifting someone else up. Peyton. I guess I could, she finally said, after standing there for a bit, like she was thinking about him. He remembered they had been talking about cooking in his kitchen. You don't have to. I can handle a whole meal. You've never cooked before, and you're going to do Easter dinner. Handle the whole meal? She asked, incredulously, but still with that calm tone that permeated pretty much everything she said. How hard can it be? He asked, a little devil-may-care grin on his face. It would be a huge flop, he was sure, and he'd be annoyed with himself on Sunday when he had guests and nothing to feed them. But he wasn't going to worry about that right now. Right, that's what I thought. I'll make a side dish, and I'll help you with the scalloped potatoes. You were having scalloped potatoes, right? Of course, he said having had no thought in his head until that second about having scalloped potatoes. She acted like it was normal to have them on Easter, so he figured that's what they'd do. Sounds good. I'll make pineapple casserole, she announced, and she saw his smile. It's a southern thing. Man, I haven't had that since I left South Carolina. They grinned together just a little shared humor at the culture they were from and how it was so similar, but strikingly different at times, to where they lived now. She shook her head, breaking the spell that seemed to fall around them. He had even taken a step forward, tempted to reach out and touch her, tempted to, he didn't know, get closer, ask her to stay, ask her to take a walk with him, or just do something that would bring them together. I'd better get to work. I came so I could get a little extra time, and I'm not getting anything done by standing here talking to you. He wanted to say he wouldn't mind, wanted to say that's what he wanted. But it was a little bit of a slap in the face to have her remind him that she was just here to make money, because she had something to do, that she would be gone when it was over. His hand had lifted just a little, and that thought caused it to drop back at his side. 
Instead of stepping forward, he stepped back, his face set. I'll make sure we have lunch. She nodded. I've been depending on you to feed me, but I can pack my own food. I just didn't want to. Not if you were going to have something. I didn't want to waste anything. That and there's really no place to keep anything cool. You're welcome to use my refrigerator any time, he said, knowing his voice was much more closed off than it had been. Thank you, she said, and maybe he imagined it, but it seemed a little bit more formal and less casual than it had been. Still, she didn't seem bothered by his abrupt change. It only altered the way she spoke, not the way she acted. With another glance and a smile, she started walking away toward the library. His whole being wanted to watch her go, but he didn't. Instead, he walked into the dining room, even though he didn't need to be in there, had no reason to be. He just couldn't stand stupidly in the hall staring in case she turned to glance back as she turned the corner. She probably wouldn't, but at any rate, he didn't want to be caught mooning over a girl that, yeah, he liked, but was all wrong for him. Chapter 15 Patience and Remembering It Is More Blessed to Give Than Receive Paul James Rasmussen, Winchester, Virginia Peyton stooped down to put her book back on the shelf. Duke and Daisy lay at her feet as usual. The conversation with her friends hadn't helped things at all. It had only served to focus her mind on the fact that Bryce was different than other men had been. Not just because of the scars. In fact, she'd gotten used to them and barely noticed them. She did figure that she'd have to talk to Owen about them before they came out. At this point, he didn't know, but she wanted him to be prepared and have some time to think about being considerate to Bryce's feelings. Funny how she wanted to protect him when he was a grown man and quite capable of protecting himself. But she felt like she'd seen a little bit of his vulnerabilities, that he'd trusted her with them. Maybe that made her feel like she needed to be more protective, or maybe it was just that she looked at him as the underdog. Maybe at one point, he was on top and had the world by the tail, so to speak. But at this point, he'd been knocked down and hurt. There was a part of her that wanted to see him healed, to see him be better. And she knew that believing in him, seeing his potential, encouraging him whenever she could, being a friend, loving him no matter what he did, were all things that could help lift him from where he was and help him become someone he never dreamed he could be. The opposite was true, too. She'd experienced that in her divorce. When someone she loved told her she was worthless, that she wasn't good enough, that she was the cause of all their problems, and he couldn't wait to get away from her. Oh, that affected a person, too. She wasn't quite sure how things would work in heaven, but she figured that people who encouraged others and helped them grow to reach their potential were going to be in a slightly different class than the people who knocked other people down and caused them to doubt whether they'd ever amount to anything. Regardless of anything she might gain in heaven, she didn't want to be the kind of person who kept anyone from being what God wanted them to be. She wanted to be the kind of person who helped others believe anything was possible because once they believed they could do it, they could. That was one of those lessons she'd learned from her divorce. It helped her see clearly the kind of person she wanted to be. And for the last ten years, she'd been deliberately trying to grow into that person. So what she had done with Bryce, by not allowing him to offend her, not getting upset when he was gruff or even rude, not demanding that she be treated with respect, but accepting him no matter what he did. Those were all things she had predetermined she wanted to do. This focus on him, this inability to get him out of her head, 
This looking forward to every interaction and trying to think of ways that she could interact with him more, that was new. She really needed to try to get over it. So, when he came in around one with sandwiches, she was almost tempted to tell him she wasn't going to stop working, wasn't going to eat with him. But not only would that hurt his feelings, it wasn't truly what she wanted. She didn't want to be fake, even if it would help her in the long run to not fall for someone she knew she shouldn't be falling for. She didn't want to fall for anyone. Marriage stunk. Instead, she straightened, putting both hands in the small of her back and stretching. Duke and Daisy stood, their shaggy bodies brushing against her legs and their tails hitting her knees as they walked past her and greeted Bryce. At some point in the last few weeks, he'd brought a small table into the library with two chairs and set it by one of the windows. She hadn't paid a lot of attention, but she thought maybe he moved one of the recliners out of the way so the table could take its place, but she couldn't remember the layout of the room enough to tell for sure. Ham salad? she asked as she got closer. Chicken salad, I think. I might have had a small taste while I was making the sandwiches, because I wasn't sure. That's encouraging, that you weren't sure. Well, I have a strong suspicion, but there's a lot of mayonnaise in there. It's really good, though. I'll take your word for it. I think I see some celery sticking out. And onions, too if you like that type of thing. I love onions. The more, the merrier. His brows rose, but he didn't say anything more, and she could feel her cheeks heating. She hadn't meant to insinuate anything about onions, but his look. It almost said that onions were something a single person ate. Surely not. Surely his mind wasn't going there. It was just her being crazy. Still, a sort of awkward silence descended, unusual for them, as she had been feeling more and more comfortable with him, even if they didn't talk all the time. There was room for silence in their relationship, and she appreciated that. They set the plates out with the sandwiches and drinks, and, as had become their custom, Bryce prayed. They both started eating without saying anything, although Peyton had to exclaim as she swallowed, this is really good. He nodded, finishing his second bite. Pam is the best. She really does a great job. But she's going to visit her family for a month in Duluth, so Charlene is going to be taking care of us. Charlene's been helping out at my store. She and the other peacemakers are manning the counter to give me a little bit of extra time to come out. They seem to have their fingers in everything. Peyton nodded. She almost mentioned how they were matchmakers and how when Charlene had first mentioned coming out here, until she had talked about the library and the books, Peyton had been very suspicious that it was another setup. Obviously, that had not been it at all, and Peyton decided talking about that might make their relationship awkward. She didn't want him thinking she was insinuating anything, because she most definitely was not. Instead, she remembered something she had wanted to talk to him about. I won't be here on Friday. I forgot to tell you that earlier. I didn't want you expecting me. I know I don't have regular hours or anything, but I just didn't want you thinking I'm coming and for me to not show up. Of course. You can pick and choose your hours. I do appreciate the heads up, though. He held a sandwich in front of him, as though studying it for a minute. And then he said, Can I ask what you're doing? His words were uttered a little low and lacked his usual confidence. Of course. She hadn't said, because she figured he wouldn't be interested. She assumed that the mundane details of her life were not something he was dying to hear, even just to make conversation. Silence was better than boring. She took a drink of her water and then said, Owen has his first baseball game. It's right after school, but in Rockerton, so I'm driving him there, and he's pretty excited about it. That's where he's been all these Fridays, right? Practicing? Yeah, 
They had practice Saturday mornings, and he stayed over at the coach's house Friday nights. She took a breath. He's nervous. I hadn't wanted to tell him that I'm nervous, too. He's never played any sports before? He has, here and there. He played t-ball for a little bit, but lately he was taking horseback riding lessons, and I thought that's where his interest was going to shift. But he played soccer last fall and decided that he wanted to play baseball this spring. He's been practicing as much as he can, but he's handicapped because his partner isn't very good. Oh, yeah. It's always best if you can play with someone who's better than you. They lift you up. Yeah, I'm about as coordinated as two thumbs on a rhinoceros, so I haven't been helping him too much, but I'm willing. Oh, you're his partner. Yeah, there are other kids in Sweetwater, and they have pickup games sometimes, but I am usually the one who gets drafted to pitch the ball back and forth after he gets home from school. I see. He nodded, and maybe he was thinking, as she had often done, that it was usually the dad out playing sports with the kids. She would have been perfectly fine with it. She hadn't played any sports when she was younger. Her favorite place to be had been the library, and if she had to go somewhere else, she might have hung out in the science lab, hoping to get in on a dissection. Not really normal. Does your daughter enjoy any sports? She asked, even though they kind of had an unspoken rule that they didn't discuss his daughter. But Kendrick was coming this weekend. Peyton thought it might be a good idea to know a little bit about her, if she was going to be spending time with her, which she assumed she would since they were staying overnight Saturday night and having Easter dinner with them on Sunday. I'm not sure, Bryce said. She got the feeling that was the kind of question that would have made him get surly and quiet just a few weeks ago. But now he leaned back on his chair, his sandwich gone. Charlene asked me earlier today what her favorite foods were so she could cook them for her. I couldn't answer that question either. It made me think what you talked about the last time we spoke, and I felt guilty. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel guilty. I just know that you'd be a really great dad, and I know she would love to have you in that position. I know. I know you didn't mean it in a bad way. I just... I know I could have done better, and I haven't. So, yeah. I don't know whether she likes sports, but I intend to find out. I'm hoping that the next two weeks will be the start of a new relationship for Kendrick and me. You're going to bring her to North Dakota? Maybe Peyton shouldn't be pressing, but she almost thought that was what he was saying. Maybe. I, I guess I feel like maybe she's not going to like me. I think there's something programmed in every kid, a love for their parents that they just can't turn off. I know they go through their teenage years and sometimes they rebel. Peyton figured they didn't have to. She knew families whose children hadn't had a rebellious teenage time, where they'd actually grown closer to their kids during the teenage years. She wasn't sure exactly how that happened, but she hoped it happened for Owen and her. Regardless, since Kendrick was only ten, it wasn't something that Bryce needed to worry about any time soon. I hope. I hope she doesn't resent all the time I wasn't there. She might. But I think sometimes kids need to see parents make mistakes, be sorry, apologize, and then watch them try to do better. But if I apologize, she'll know I messed up, and she'll hold it over my head for the rest of my life. Only if you allow her to. What do you mean? Well, you just said it. You try to do better. She can't make you feel guilty for what you've apologized for for what you've put behind you. Sure, maybe you could have done better, but from this point on, you're going to do the best you can. And while no one is perfect, she has to give you credit for effort. After all, there are going to be times where she's going to mess up, and you're not going to say, you're a terrible person because you made a mistake, and that's how I'm going to view you for the rest of your life, as a terrible person who made a mistake. 
She didn't know whether she was explaining it very well or not, but Bryce nodded his head thoughtfully. I see. That's a good point. <laughs> Seems like every time I'm with you, I learn something new, something I can put into practice in my life. She tried not to allow his praise to go to her head. She definitely didn't want to say that every time they were together, she could see spending the rest of her life with Bryce. She didn't want to, and she was definitely going to be fighting that. Chapter 16 Keeping God in your marriage as the threefold cord and honoring your commitment to your spouse through the good times and especially the bad ones. Fern Pena Peyton sat on the second row of the bleachers with an easy view of the baseball field. There had been several ladies sitting behind her who had smiled at her as she climbed in. She still felt a little conspicuous being alone, but having been divorced for ten years, she was used to going to things by herself. End-of-year assemblies, track and field days, church events, whatever. Sometimes she went with friends, but she hated to ask anyone to take off work to drive to Rockerton. Shasta was catching up on some artwork that she'd promised would be finished this week, and Fridays were big days for Sadie with the trucking company paperwork. Charlene and the other peacemakers were going to come, but the shop had been busier than normal, and they had insisted on staying while they shooed Peyton out the door. The person she really wanted, Bryce, was one she hadn't even considered asking. He would have no interest in attending a junior high baseball game where he knew none of the players. She wouldn't have wanted him to come to cheer her son just because she enjoyed his company. So, ultimately, she brought her headphones and listened to the narrator she loved on YouTube. She had started the book earlier in the day, and he'd gotten her caught up in the action, and she didn't want to turn him off. Still, when the game began, she pulled her headphones out of her ears and put them in her purse along with her phone. The big North Dakota sky was bright blue, with just a hint of orange along the horizon, indicating the sun would be going down soon. She brought a jacket, because from experience, she knew it would be chilly. She tried to learn a little bit about baseball, and Owen had even had her watching a few games on TV. She'd already known the basics, and the game wasn't that difficult to follow. The principle was easy. The pitcher threw the ball. The batter tried to hit it. The pitcher was supposed to try to throw it so the batter wouldn't be able to hit it, but within a certain parameter of space directly over home plate. Not bad for a bookworm. She tried not to be too proud of herself. Owen was not up to bat the first time his team was up. He jogged out to the outfield with his teammates as the other team got the third strike. This was one of the things he had been concerned about. He wasn't super great at catching a ball. He had a ton of coordination, but needed practice. As much as she'd been trying to work with him at home, she wasn't great at throwing either. Sometimes she wondered how those things happened, because the very first ball that was hit was a fly ball arcing gracefully down, directly at her son. She held her hands together in her lap and held her breath as Owen put his glove up. Seconds later, the ball bounced on the ground beside him. Not only did he not catch the ball, but he didn't see where it was lying at his feet, and he spent several seconds looking around for it before he found it picked it up, and threw it. Only, he threw it the way she did, which was the harder she tried to throw, the more she usually managed to pile-drive the ball into the ground about three feet in front of her. There were titters from the crowd. Hopefully, Owen didn't hear the laughter. He ran forward, grabbing the ball that he'd just thrown a whole yard, picking it up to throw it again as the runner rounded second. He did the exact same thing a second time, getting a big overhand swing, and then, instead of releasing the ball when he needed to, he held on just a bit too long, and the ball drove into the ground. Who let that kid onto the field? One of the ladies behind her said. I don't know. You'd think his parents would work with him a little bit, 
It's almost like he's being this bad on purpose. Yeah, I can hardly think that someone would be that terrible on accident, or if they were that bad, that their parents would allow them on the field. Peyton tried not to listen. They weren't being deliberately mean to her. They were just frustrated with her son and probably didn't want their own children to come home from losing a game because one of the players obviously hadn't played much baseball. There wasn't anything she could do about it now, and she tried hard to just focus on watching her kid and not listening to the ladies behind her. Owen ran forward one more time. This time, when he picked the ball up, he threw it underhanded as hard as he could. Usually, that worked pretty well. It was the only way he'd thrown up until he was about six or so. But he was out of practice doing that because he'd been throwing overhand for years. He must have frozen because of the excitement or pressure of the game. Whatever it was, he threw it underhand and the ball went practically straight up in the air. Peyton watched in dismay and fear. She needn't have worried. The ball had not gone exactly straight up and it landed about four feet behind him. It wasn't hard to hear the shocked outrage of the ladies behind her, which was slightly more animated than the gasps of the crowd. Some of them were moms like herself who had compassion for Owen, but some of them were people whose kids were in it to win, and Peyton couldn't blame them. No one played a game hoping to lose. Still, Owen and she had done the best they could. They'd tried put aside time to practice, and did work on these things. Another kid came up and grabbed the ball while the runner scored. Owen's shoulders slumped, and Peyton's heart went out to him. She wanted to go out on the field, put her arms around him, and comfort him. She was his mom. She hated to see this happen to him. But she sat still, knowing as painful as it was to both of them, it was a good lesson for him. I'm going to complain to the coach. It is outrageous that they would let someone like that on the team. There needs to be some kind of standard. I agree. I know it's a community league, but we can't just let people who've never seen a baseball in their life before stand out there acting like they know what they're doing. Put him in a corner somewhere until he can say the word ball. The ladies didn't mean to be unkind, truly. Peyton's throat tightened, and she tried hard not to cry. Thankfully, the next few balls didn't go anywhere near her son, and the team got three outs in the next three batters. As the team jogged in toward home plate, she felt a present sliding beside her, and she turned her head in time to see Bryce lean down. Is this seat taken? No. The tightness in her throat and the heaviness in her heart lightened some as he slid in, sitting a respectable six inches from her, but smiling down and lifting her spirits. I didn't expect to see you here. It was an honest statement. She hadn't invited him because she didn't expect he'd want to come. I asked around. Actually, I called Nolt. We went to school together, and I figured it wouldn't hurt. There was a lot in those words that Bryce had reached out to someone in Sweetwater, that he talked to an old friend, that he had wanted to get out of his house and had taken the initiative to call. She smiled at him but didn't say anything. She didn't want to make him feel more self-conscious than he already felt. It's good to see you here. Has he been up yet? No, he hasn't. She almost started telling him about the disastrous fly ball, but she was acutely aware of the ladies behind her, and as Bryce and she lapsed into the silence when the first batter came up, she heard them quite clearly. Is that the famous baseball player? The one who lives in Sweetwater? Looks like him. He was the one who had those racial slurs on social media, lied about it, and cancel culture took care of him. I can't believe he showed his face around here, especially as ugly as it is. I think the accident was karma. The universe was getting him back for the things he had done. Can you imagine saying the things that he did? 
and putting them out there for his millions of followers to see. I don't think he had millions of followers. I think they made him out to be more popular than what he actually was. I know he had over a million. He had that endorsement from that big shoe company. His face was on all the TV commercials. Maybe you're right. Whatever. I'm glad he got knocked down. Someone like him doesn't deserve to be an example to our children. I agree. The batter hit the ball. The stands cheered as it went over the outfield fence. A home run. Peyton clapped loud and long, not because she knew the kid or because she was exceptionally happy with the home run, but more because she was trying to drown out the sound of the people behind her. As soon as they started talking, Bryce had stiffened beside her. She wasn't sure whether it was the mention of his face and how ugly they thought it was, or the mention of how he got what he deserved, but she could almost feel him withdrawing. She had swallowed down her anger when they talked about her son, trying to excuse it away, trying not to get upset. Owen wasn't there and couldn't hear them, and they weren't doing it to be deliberately mean. It was different with Bryce because he could hear them, and they had to know it. She wanted to turn around, give the ladies a piece of her mind, and tell them that they could keep a decent tongue in their head, that they shouldn't talk about stuff they didn't know anything about. Actually, she wanted to turn around and grab them by the throats and knock their heads together so badly she almost couldn't breathe. She fought the urge. That was not the way God wanted her to behave. God wanted her to be humble, wanted her to love them the way they were. After all, how many times had she said unkind things about people? How many times had she been frustrated and angry and let things come out of her mouth that she shouldn't have? It wasn't right for her to judge those people, even though they were hurting someone she cared for. She found herself biting a nail and yanked her finger out of her mouth as Owen came up to bat. They'd practiced batting even less than they'd practiced catching and throwing because they had to go to the park to do that. She wanted to pray that he hit the ball, and she knew God cared, but when there was so much suffering in the world, she wasn't sure whether that was appropriate. It was a selfish prayer. Instead, she prayed that whatever happened, Owen would learn the lesson that God wanted him to learn and come through this trial with courage and character, that God would be glorified however events unfolded. And then she said a little prayer for herself, that she would be able to also go through this trial with courage and character. And then she added a little aside, asking God to give her the self-control to not punch anybody's lights out as well. Nervous? Bryce leaned down and said, a smile on his lips. There were shadows in his eyes, though, almost as though he regretted coming. She couldn't blame him after what she'd overheard. Her fingers were squeezed together as her son came out of the cage carrying a bat. She nodded. You're going to cut the circulation off in your fingers. He nodded at her hands. She deliberately unclenched them. Maybe if the ladies hadn't been behind them, maybe if she had never heard what they said, maybe if she weren't already so nervous and worked up, she would have thought about her next move a little before she did it. But she didn't, and her hand slid slowly across and touched Bryce's fingers. It was a kind of question, a gentle nudge asking if it would be okay. Or something like that. She wasn't sure but his body jerked when he felt her touch, and he looked down at her hand and then over at her. Chapter 17 Forgiveness Natalia Lochno, California Peyton had her eyes glued on her son, but when she felt his gaze, she turned her head. She supposed there were questions in her eyes, and maybe a little fear, too. Fear that she would be rejected. But he seemed to be asking, Are you sure? 
She flattened her hand, so it wasn't just her fingers touching his, but her entire hand over his. Her stomach spun like a washing machine as she waited for his response. Maybe in the back of her head, she had been wanting him to know that she was on his side, that it didn't matter what the ladies behind them said. And he didn't even know that they'd been talking about her son before they started talking about him. Whatever it was, it wasn't like her. She didn't back down. After just a second, but it felt like eternity, his hand flipped over and their fingers threaded together. Maybe that was something he was used to. Probably as a popular ball player, he'd been with a lot of women. But she hadn't held anyone's hand since her husband had left her. Hadn't wanted to. And now, she found it was exactly what she wanted to do. She smiled, relief and happiness coming out, though maybe there was a little pain in her eyes because his brows didn't quite unfurl when he smiled back at her. She squeezed his hand and then turned her face forward again, not wanting to miss her son, but also nervous that not only would the ladies behind her be angry if he struck out, but Bryce might think less of her as well. After all, it was natural for human beings to love competence. It was also natural for them to shy away from incompetence. And when a person had children, the incompetence of their children reflected back on them. Their parenting skills, their genes, the way they'd been raising them. Maybe even their food choices. People could judge a lot of things. And that was their right, their prerogative. If that's how they wanted to spend their lives, judging others, making nasty comments about them, that was their choice even if they were directed at her. Her worth was as a child of God, and that was her son's worth, and Bryce's worth as well. It wasn't contingent upon what the ladies behind them said about him. And maybe they just needed someone to love them too. It was easier for her to be strong and think about it that way when Bryce's fingers were threaded through hers and she felt like it was the two of them together and not her alone against the world. Owen had come up to the plate. He swung at the first two pitches and missed both times. That's the kid that couldn't catch the ball. The one that couldn't throw it either. It's hardly shocking that he can't bat either. Bryce couldn't help but hear. She was sure. His fingers tightened around hers. He shifted and she looked at him, turning her head and meeting his eyes. He had his mouth open like he was going to say something, but she shook her head gently and allowed a little pleading to enter her eyes. His jaw clenched, but he closed his mouth and faced forward again, pulling her hand toward him, linking their arms together, and letting it rest on his lap. There were still six inches between them, but she felt closer somehow. Owen swung at the last pitch. Strike three. She figured after the debacle in the field, he wouldn't have the confidence to hit the ball even if he could. Sometimes when something knocked a person's confidence down, it was hard to get it back, especially without help. Bryce didn't say anything, and neither did she. They watched another inning in silence, with Owen not making quite as many disastrous mistakes as he had with dropping the ball and throwing it backwards, but he made several mistakes that caused the ladies behind them to talk. They said a couple more things about Bryce, but it was pretty obvious to Peyton that Bryce was less upset about those than the comments that were made about her son. Hopefully, he realized the ladies didn't know they were talking about her kid. Whether he did or not, he didn't say anything and she was grateful. Their team was up to bat with bases loaded at the bottom of the sixth inning. They were behind by two, and Peyton recognized the kid coming up to the plate as the one who had hit a home run at his first at bat. He'd struck out the next time, and she was pulling for him to come back from that. His first two pitches were balls. He stood with the bat over home plate again when the next pitch came through.
He swung at that one. The ball hit the bat with a resounding crack and flew over the home run fence. The ladies behind them screamed, and they must have jumped to their feet in their excitement, because Peyton had been sitting there thinking she was about ready to put on her jacket. When the ball flew over the fence, the lady screamed, and suddenly she felt wet and cold. She jumped up, not because of excitement, but because of the soda and ice that was dampening her shirt. She yanked her hand away from Bryce's and batted at her shirt, knowing it was pointless. She was just getting more wet and sticky as well. Oh, my goodness, I am so sorry. I did not mean to do that. The lady behind her was sincere. Peyton could tell as she turned and looked at her. Her eyes were big. Her hand covered her mouth as she looked at Peyton's soaked shirt. It's okay, Peyton heard herself say. She was a little bit tempted to lash out at the lady, to talk about her, or rake her over the coals for the way she had talked about Owen and Bryce. But that wasn't giving grace. It wasn't kindness. It wasn't living the way Jesus lived. It was living according to her flesh, living the way she felt, instead of what she knew to be right. I didn't realize the lid was loose, honestly, and I forgot all about it sitting in my lap. It's okay, Peyton insisted with her hand up, stopping the lady from saying any more. We all make mistakes. Everybody has accidents. That home run was pretty exciting anyway. That was my son, the lady said, barely containing her pride. That's great. I'm sure he's probably one of the boys on the team that my son looks up to. The lady beamed, nodding. She glanced at Bryce, and maybe there was a little bit of derision in her eyes, but not quite as much. He had turned and was watching them, and while the lady's eyes widened at his face, she didn't make any comments. Instead, she turned back to Peyton and said, Which one is yours? The one that dropped the first fly ball, Peyton said, her chin lifted. She kept a smile on her face and reminded herself that Jesus loved this woman, and no matter what her response was, she would not be offended. She would not be offended, and she would try to love. Her heart beat hard, though, and her stomach clenched and unclenched, like her fist wanted to do. Not because she was still tempted to hit the woman, but she needed a release from her nervous energy. Was the woman going to call her names and blame her for the fact that the team was behind? Has he ever played ball before? The woman asked, blinking, as she remembered exactly who her son was. No, he and I have spent some time behind my shop pitching the ball back and forth, and we practice batting a little in the park. But I'm a single mom, and his dad is not in the picture, and I don't know anything about baseball. That's too bad. It looks like he needs a little bit of help. Peyton bit her tongue and nodded her head, her smile feeling a little strange, but it was still there. This is his first game. I know he was nervous. Maybe I'll talk to my son about helping him some. That would be sweet. The lady nodded, and Peyton turned back around and sat down sitting a little closer to Bryce in order to avoid the ice and soda that was now on the bench beside her. Bryce didn't say anything, and the game ended without any more excitement. Their team won by two runs. Peyton smiled and nodded at the ladies as they filed off the bleachers. Then she and Bryce stood facing each other. She couldn't leave until Owen had gone in and the coach talked to the team. Bryce watched the women walk away before he spoke. What did they mean about Owen dropping the ball? She explained what happened, and he nodded, his eyes dark. You handled that really well. I, I was ashamed of my thoughts after I saw how you acted. You would have been ashamed of my thoughts as well, because I was thinking how nice it would be to turn around and grab them by the throat to knock their heads together but that was mostly when they were talking about Owen and how he didn't deserve to be on the field, and then later when they were talking about you. Harsh. Yeah. She lifted her shoulder. 
But I kept telling myself she didn't really mean it, didn't mean to be mean, and she wouldn't have been saying that about Owen if she knew he was my son. She was just frustrated because she didn't want to lose. That's no excuse for unkindness. No, but I've been unkind. Who am I to judge her for her unkindness, when I have just as much unkindness in my past? Maybe even more. She smiled a little. I killed my husband a million different ways in my head the year after he cheated and left. Strangled him, tortured him, every time I held my son while he cried and asked when Daddy was going to come home. I wanted to rip him apart, piece by piece, and listen to him scream and cry the way I had to listen to my son scream and cry. Maybe she shared too much. That was pretty violent. But it was true, every word. How could I judge those ladies? I mean, yeah, their words were hurting me, were hurting you, which hurt me. But I have been just as unkind. But you didn't say it. You didn't hurt anyone with your words. The thoughts are contained in your head. Jesus said that if you even so much as think about killing someone in your mind, you're as guilty as someone who's actually done it. She looked down. Sometimes I think the only difference between an actual murderer and me is opportunity. And I think that's what Jesus meant by that. Maybe if my husband had been standing in front of me, Maybe if a gun had been handy, or a knife, or a baseball bat, or a pair of scissors, I would have used whatever it was to hurt him. I just never had that opportunity. He nodded slowly, as though digesting her words. If he regretted sitting beside someone so terrible and holding her hand, she didn't want to look on his face and know it. So she kept her gaze down, huddled in her jacket. I never thought of it that way. I've, I'm just as bad as anyone that I could ever judge. And if I'm guilty of murder, even if I think about it, then I am a murderer. She kept her gaze directed down, but she agreed. It was just a lack of opportunity. Or a different kind of upbringing. Maybe if she wouldn't have had an upbringing where her parents had cared about her, she would have ended up killing her husband. For real. Who knew? There were certain people I dreamed of killing in some way, as my world tumbled down around me, with the accident and the whole cancel culture thing. I suppose, too, the accident wasn't my fault, and the other guy got away with nothing. It was frustrating. Yeah, but I think we're all given trials like that. Trials where we have to grow and become better. And then we're given the opportunity to look at others to offer them the grace God has given us. So often I fail. I don't know if I've ever succeeded. I'm not even sure I've tried. That seems like advanced Christianity, and I feel like I'm still in Christianity 101. She laughed. There's always something to strive for, something to get better at. As we look at ourselves and the more we learn and grow, the more we see ourselves as what we are, as the sinners we are, instead of the saint we used to think we were. The closer we get to Christ's perfection, the more his perfection illuminates our imperfection. And not in a bad way. It's in a way that shows us what we need to work on, where we need to get better. People around them had cleared out of the bleachers and there were just a few parents standing around waiting for their children. Are we still on for tomorrow? He asked, after a few moments of silence. Yes, I was planning on it. I'll be bringing some groceries. Do you need me to pick anything up? I uh, honestly don't know. I've been doing some research on YouTube. Is it terrible that I'm looking up how to make scalloped potatoes at my age? <laughs> no, I think it's sweet. She looked up at him and saw his grin, but she kind of got the feeling that he liked her words, too. Maybe you better withhold judgment until you taste them. If you leave the table hungry on Sunday, you might not be too happy with me. I don't think you can mess up cooking a ham. 
And as long as there's ham, I'm not going to leave hungry. Plus, we have my pineapple casserole. Can I admit I've been looking forward to that? It's been years since I've had it, and I'm pretty excited. I hope mine tastes like what you're used to. I've seen them made different ways over the years. It won't matter. Pineapple casserole will taste good no matter what. Are you picking Kendrick up tomorrow? Yeah, she should be there tomorrow afternoon when you get there. She and Paisley. All right. But in case I get delayed, or her flight does, the door will be unlocked. It will? Don't tell anyone, but I never locked the door. Really? She thought of all the books in the library, and she couldn't even begin to put a number on how much they would be worth. But someone could hardly go in and steal enough books to make it worthwhile. Could they? Really? So if I'm not there, go on in. Make yourself at home. I will. Owen, too. Of course. Everything will be fine. She got the feeling that he was talking just to prolong their conversation, but there didn't seem to be anything else to say. So he started to turn, and as he did so, his hand came out and touched hers. He took her fingers in his and squeezed. She had thought that maybe he wanted to raise them to his lips and kiss her, but he didn't. Just having him squeeze her hand made her breathless. Then he walked away without saying anything more. She was over 30 and way too mature to do it, but she watched him go, admiring. Not just the way he looked when he walked, although she did admire that, but also the courage it had taken him to come. The way he was absolutely right, because those women had talked about him, had made fun of him and derided him for the things that had happened in his past. And yet, he stayed, had handled it graciously. He had been kind. He'd stood beside her and, just with his presence, gave her the courage to do what she knew she was supposed to do, to be kind as well. He hadn't given her a lot of commentary on baseball, which kind of surprised her, being that he loved the game so much. He hadn't given her a blow-by-blow blow or told her what all the kids were doing wrong or right. He hadn't even given her any tips for Owen. Maybe he didn't want to be one of those people who shoved his nose where it wasn't welcome. Or maybe he didn't want to sound like a know-it-all. Or maybe he just didn't want to talk about baseball anymore. Perhaps because baseball had scarred the inside of him just as much as his accident had scarred the outside. She considered that and figured she wouldn't know until she asked. When Owen walked over, his shoulders were slumped and he looked dejected. Hey, bud, she said softly with a little smile, but nothing exciting. She knew he wasn't very happy with himself. Hey, Mom, I'm sorry you wasted your time today. I didn't waste my time. I had a really good time. I did feel a little bad for you, though. It looked like you were nervous since this was your first game. I suck. She took a breath, blowing it out just a little. What did she say to that? The worse you do, the more room there is for improvement. I'm guessing, because you're determined and you persevere, that at your next game, you're going to do better. And every game is going to be an improvement from that. I'm quitting. At the end of the season, you certainly may. No, right now. They'd reached the car, and she dug in her purse for her key. You can't start something and then quit. Your team has just enough players to play, and if you quit, they won't be able to. None of them will care. I'm the worst player on the team, and I suck. Your physical abilities will get better with practice, and practice is something we know how to do. Your mental attitude needs to change, though, because if you think you suck, then you do. He lifted his head, his eyes narrowed, because he probably didn't appreciate his mom agreeing with him. 
And if you think you don't, then that's going to be true as well. She lifted her brows. Zeb Springfield offered to throw the ball with me and practice batting some, but I told him no. Is he still here? Peyton froze with her keys in her hand. Maybe that was the kid of the woman who sat behind them. I don't know. Can you find him? She asked. Owen lifted his head, looking around. He's over there. Do you want to work with him some, or would you rather do it with me? I'm not going to get better either way. Of course you're not. Not with that attitude. Now answer my question. I'll tell him later. I just want to go home now. Peyton pressed the unlock button on her key fob and figured that her son could take the time he needed in order to get his head in the right space. She couldn't force him to have the right attitude immediately, when she didn't always have the right attitude immediately. She hoped she'd given him the words he needed. Now he needed space to think about it. Hopefully he would, and would come to the right conclusion. Chapter 18 Christ as the Center of Your Home Sherry Cooper Paisley and Kendrick's plane was delayed a half an hour, and Peyton and Owen were already there when Bryce pulled in the drive. Kendrick had been a little standoffish at first, but she was precocious and outgoing, just like he used to be, and by the time they parked by the house, she was talking a mile a minute, and he was listening intently, determined that he would find out everything he could about his daughter. And not just because she was his responsibility. As he thought about that, he realized that was a reason, but it wasn't the only one. He loved her. He had stayed out of her life because he loved her and wanted the best for her, because that's what a man did when he loved someone. He did the best thing for them, even if that meant he had to sacrifice. That's the way love was supposed to be, anyway. He really didn't know too many people who loved like that, though. He kind of thought Peyton might be like that. After all, it took a certain amount of humility, which was sacrificing a person's pride, to allow someone to say unkind things to you and let it roll off your back. Pride dictated that he turn around and give them as good as they gave him. Jesus showed a different way, a less prideful, more humble way. Unfortunately, even Christians thought it was okay to put people in their place if they weren't being kind or weren't living up to the expectations they had for them. He nodded with his daughter, joining her in conversation, and by the time they got out of the car, she stepped up to him grabbed his hand, and looked at the house. This is a big house for you to live in by yourself, she finally said. Aunt Carol's house was not exactly small, but it was nothing compared to the mansion he owned. Yeah, I need a little girl to fill up all the empty spaces. I think you're going to need more than just one, she said seriously. It made him laugh a little and he held tight to her hand while he told Paisley to follow them, and he would lead them to their rooms. Paisley was quiet and older than he remembered, close to thirty if he was guessing right. He had her information in his file, but he couldn't remember, just knew that she seemed like a good candidate, and Aunt Carol said she did an excellent job with Kendrick, attentive and caring, but not overbearing. Paisley put him in mind of the kind of person who loved children, but would also love to spend evenings curled up by the fire with a book. She didn't seem like the kind of person who wanted or needed a lot of attention, and he supposed that was a quality of an excellent nanny. He could hardly believe it was going to be this easy with his daughter. He hadn't seen her forever, and now she was holding his hand and jabbering without ceasing. He walked upstairs, showed Paisley the room she would have, and showed Kendrick her room, which joined Paisley's. Where do you sleep, Daddy? Kendrick asked. 
he pointed across the hall. That's my room. He looked back at Paisley. I don't have a housekeeper. I wash my own sheets and clothes. He didn't know what he should say about her duties. He was fairly certain at his aunt's. She did her own clothes, but he didn't know who washed Kendrick's stuff. I'm used to doing my own clothes, Mr. Shaker, and while Mrs. Henry normally does Kendrick's things, I don't have a problem doing it for the two weeks we're here. Thank you. He made a mental note to make sure she got something extra for her extra work. What are we going to do now? Kendrick asked as she skipped down the stairs beside him. She was ten, but she acted a little younger in his opinion. Not that he knew that much about kids, just... She hadn't gotten into the teenaged angst, where she was quiet and withdrawn and starting to think she was too old for childish things. He supposed he owed Paisley and his Aunt Carol a thank you for that. That they hadn't forced her out of her childhood too soon. I was thinking it would be nice to go play ball in the yard. We have some company I wanted to introduce you to. Maybe he shouldn't have asked Peyton and Owen to stay, but not only did he want to spend as much time as he could with Peyton, he hadn't been sure how things would go with Kendrick, and he figured that having them here would help break the ice for them. Paisley followed them downstairs. At the bottom, he said to Kendrick and her, Do you and Paisley want to go outside? I have someone else I'd like you to meet. I think she'll come outside with us. Someone else? You have another daughter? Kendrick asked with childish innocence. <laughs> no, you're my only child. He ruffled her hair, smiling a little. His heart squeezed at the little girl look in her eyes. He could see himself on her face. Unbelievable that there was a little human running around that was half him. She's a grown woman, and she's working in the library. Kendrick nodded, not seeming interested in the library. Maybe that would be something Peyton would help with. He smiled to himself as Kendrick waved and skipped off, holding tight to Paisley's hand. Bryce walked to the library, eager. He supposed he could have taken Kendrick with him and introduced her to Peyton, but he wanted to give Peyton a little warning. It, it meant more to him than he wanted to admit that Peyton was going to meet his daughter. Hey, he said as he walked in, his eyes landing on her right away. She was almost exactly where she was the last time he was in here. It was slow work. Hey, you're home. Did you get her okay? she asked, looking at the book in her hand and then setting it down carefully on the little table she had beside her and stepping down off the stepladder she was on. Yeah, I didn't want to bring her in here without warning you first. He almost said that he wanted them to hit it off and to have the best first meeting possible, but he didn't. So I thought I'd tell you, and if you want me to, I can bring her in, or I thought we could play catch together in the yard. He wasn't sure how she would feel about that, so he went slow. I was thinking of Owen and working a little with him. Uh, I thought I might be able to help him, only if he's interested. I have a tendency to be pretty intense about baseball, and I didn't want to drive him away by being too much, especially if he was discouraged with it anyway. By the smile on her face, he thought he maybe said the right thing. I think he'd really appreciate that, and you're right. He was pretty dejected yesterday and yesterday evening. Then last night, we were sitting on the porch swing together. It was late, and I don't usually let him stay up that late. But I knew he was feeling pretty bad. He was sitting with me, which I figured he just wanted to be around someone he knew loved him and accepted him. Bryce nodded. Then he started talking about the things I told him earlier, because you're right. He said he wanted to quit. He hated it and didn't want to play anymore. I told him he was welcome to quit as soon as the season was over. She pursed her lips and ran a hand over the bookshelf. So, yeah, after he had some time to think about it, he decided he wants to dig in. He wants to practice and be the best he can, but he's not sure how to start. 
the lady that was behind us really did have her son ask if he wanted to practice with him, and I think Owen is going to take him up on it, but... She grunted. Of course, he'd rather do it with you. Of course? Yeah, he really likes you. Bryce hadn't known. Maybe Owen just liked him because Peyton said nice things about him, but it didn't matter. It made him feel good to think he still had one fan, anyway. You coming? he asked. And maybe he was crazy, but he held out a hand. Her smile did not fade as she nodded, walking forward and slipping her hand into his. It felt just as good to him today as it had the day before at the ball game. When he was younger, hand-holding wasn't exactly something that he strived for. He always wanted more. Now he was older, maybe just old enough to appreciate the little things. Or maybe he'd just been through enough to appreciate the trust that her hand in his showed. They didn't say anything as they walked to the children in Paisley. The kids looked up as they approached. Bryce noticed Owen looking at his mom, then looking at the clasped hands between them. Bryce hadn't considered what the kids might say, and now it was too late to let go. He didn't want her to think he was ashamed of her, or that he didn't want to be associated with her, even if it was just their children. If he pulled back and put distance between them, it might say to her that he didn't want her. Unless he had time to explain, which he didn't. So he held tight and figured that if this was the direction he wanted to go, they were going to have to face it eventually. Is that your girlfriend? Kendrick asked, not shy. She didn't seem particularly upset either. In fact, if he had to, he would say her face looked hopeful. Girlfriend. He felt like he was maybe a little bit old to be doing a girlfriend thing. He wanted a wife. Not just someone he was hanging out with for fun, but wasn't serious about. Of course, was he serious about Peyton? He admired her, enjoyed spending time with her, couldn't get her out of his head. They had a lot of the same values, and yeah. He hadn't been that serious about anyone, ever. Most of his relationships were just looking at what he could get out of them but Peyton pushed him to be more. Not in a bad way, not in a way where he didn't want to go where she was pushing, but in a way where he appreciated being with someone who made him a better person. Maybe he paused too long, but he turned and looked at Peyton, wanting to give an honest answer, but not wanting to scare her either. I don't think so, but... I think she's more special to me than a girlfriend. He wasn't sure exactly what was going across her face. Maybe surprise, and then a little smile that said he'd said the right thing. He wasn't very good at always saying things right, and he wasn't entirely sure if he wanted her to be saddled to someone like him for the rest of her life, any more than he wanted Kendrick to have a dad she was ashamed of. But Peyton's smile grew warm, and she squeezed his hand. She'd said she didn't want to be in a relationship, didn't want to get married again, had done the marriage thing and hated it. So maybe he'd hear about this later, even though he hadn't said anything about marriage. She's pretty, Kendrick said. Bryce gave himself a mental shake, pulling his attention back to his daughter. I think so, too. Her name is Peyton, and she already knows you're Kendrick and you're my daughter. She turned her head and looked over her shoulder at Owen. Is that your mom? Owen nodded, still hanging back, like he wasn't sure what to do about this development. Is she a good mom? Kendrick asked, with her typical say-whatever-was-on-her-mind attitude. Owen still wasn't smiling, but he gave a short nod at Kendrick the best. Peyton's hand jerked in his, as though his words surprised her, but of course they had to make her feel amazing. 
Then Owen's eyes went to their hands again, and he looked at Bryce. Are you going to be my dad? Wow, that was a hard question. He didn't know how to answer it, so he said, I guess I need to talk to your mom about that, but I think any man would be proud to be your dad. Owen wasn't as easily placated as Kendrick, and his eyes narrowed a bit, as though he realized that was a bit of a non-answer before he nodded. We're out here because we were hoping we could toss the ball a bit with you guys. Really? Kendrick asked, her eyes going big as she looked around the circle of people. Sure. Paisley is welcome to play, or if she'd rather go take a rest, it's up to her. If you don't mind, traveling makes me tired. I'd like to go take a shower and rest a bit. Paisley smiled a bit as she said it, and Bryce got the feeling she was giving them time to be together without her. He turned to Peyton. Are you okay hanging out here with us for a bit? Tossing the ball around? I'm supposed to be working, Peyton reminded him, but her brows were lifted like she was asking a question. Can you spare some time for us? He asked her, wanting to ask her so many other things. Things that were not appropriate for him to ask in front of the kids. Of course. I just didn't want you thinking that I was slacking. I'm the one who suggested it, and I'd rather have you playing with us than working. Those books will be here next year this time, ten years from now. She smiled and nodded, as though as long as it was okay with him, it was perfectly fine with her as well. He liked that, her hand in his, her agreement to be with him and her son to hang out with him and his daughter, and he was pretty sure they were going to have an amazing evening. Chapter 19 Number 1. Communication is Key Love and Family Priscilla in Western Australia Peyton sat on the grass, Duke's head in her lap. Kendrick sat beside her, brushing Daisy's hair. Duke already had his makeover. Hopefully he was in touch with his feminine side. He seemed okay with the hair clips that Kendrick had used to pull the hair on top of his head between his ears into two little ponytails, which stuck straight up in the air. Peyton had to admit he looked adorable, and he was very long-suffering. Kendrick had gotten tired of playing ball, and she and Peyton had been working on the dogs for over an hour while Bryce and Owen continued to pitch the ball to each other. Bryce had given Owen some tips. At least, that's what Peyton assumed he had been doing when he walked over and put his arm around Owen's shoulders and spoke low in his ear. She didn't know much about baseball, but it looked like Owen was holding his glove at a slightly different angle, and he was releasing the ball sooner in the arc of his arm. She also overheard Bryce telling Owen that they could work on batting some tomorrow afternoon. Peyton hadn't been planning on staying long after they ate Easter dinner together, but she supposed she didn't have anything pressing to do at home. What do you think of this? Kendrick said, taking Daisy's head in both of her hands and turning it so Peyton could see the ponytails Kendrick had put on top of Daisy's head. She matches Duke, Peyton said with a smile. She looks beautiful. You're very good at that. For as young as she was, she had the patience to sit and stick with what she'd chosen to do. She'd given both dogs full-body grooming, and they'd both enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. I like doing this. She spoke matter-of-factly, but then her face fell and her hand stilled. I wish I could live here with Daddy. Because there are dogs here? And Daddy. He's here, and since I don't have a mom, it would be nice if I at least had a dad. Her cute little face scrunched up, and Peyton was afraid for a moment that she was going to cry. She didn't, but it was a few minutes before her hands started moving along the dog's fur again. Peyton wasn't sure what to say. 
She couldn't promise her that she would ever have parents, couldn't tell her where she would live. She didn't want to tell her that she would be able to stay, because Peyton just didn't know. But she didn't want to try to talk her out of it either, especially since she thought that Bryce might actually be open to the idea of moving his daughter to North Dakota to live with him here. Peyton's eyes went from watching the little girl to looking at the man she'd been stealing glances at all afternoon. He moved with an athletic grace that was beautiful to watch. The way he handled the ball seemed natural and almost instinctive. Maybe he had some natural talent, but Peyton would be willing to bet that most of the reason he looked so good doing it was because he had practiced for hours on end. Maybe that was something that Owen would learn from him, that to be successful in anything, it took hard work and determination and persistence. No wonder he was so upset when he lost it all. Daddy used to get paid to play baseball. Kendrick's voice cut through Peyton's thoughts. I heard he was pretty good at it. That's what Aunt Carol says. I never saw him play. Kendrick had been cheerful and precocious all day, but now she seemed to have settled into a melancholy mood. Struggling with whether she should try to tease her out of the mood or probe deeper to see if there was something Kendrick wanted to talk about, Peyton gave Kendrick a gentle smile. We're watching him play now. But he used to play on TV. That's a lot different than playing with a little boy in the backyard. It is, but maybe helping people is more important than doing it for yourself. Kendrick scrunched up her face, like she didn't understand Peyton's comment. She probably didn't. Peyton hadn't said it very well anyway. What she meant was that a person got a lot of accolades when they were good at playing sports, baseball in Bryce's case. But what Peyton admired more than talent on the field was character off. She had been telling Kendrick that her dad had character. Maybe Kendrick was too little to appreciate it. I guess I wish he wasn't a famous baseball player, because then he'd spend more time with me. Her lower lip trembled. I don't know why he doesn't like me. Oh, Kendrick, Peyton said, reaching out and pulling the little girl into her arms. She came easily but that gentle touch seemed to release her tears, and she started sobbing. He doesn't want to have anything to do with me. He doesn't really love me. He hates me. Peyton knew the real reason Bryce had kept Kendrick in South Carolina while he was in North Dakota, but she wasn't sure that was her prerogative to explain it. She felt like Kendrick's dad should tell Kendrick why he hadn't been spending time with her but she couldn't just sit there and allow the little girl to think her dad didn't love her. It's because he loves you that he kept you away from him. That's not true. If he loved me, he'd want me with him. Peyton rubbed her back until her fresh set of sobs subsided, and she felt like Kendrick would listen. He was afraid people would make fun of you if they saw you with him. <laughs> Why? Kendrick asked, backing up a little and looking at Peyton's face, as though she were curious as to whether or not Peyton was serious. Because of the scars on his face. Peyton couldn't see sugarcoating it. It wasn't like Kendrick couldn't see them. Because he looks funny? Kendrick asked, wiping tears off her cheek with the back of her hand. Yes. Surely you've heard kids making fun of something? Your dad didn't want to bring you here to be with him when he knows people will make fun of you when they see him. Not that it's okay. It's never okay to make fun of someone in a mean way. But he thought eventually you might not want to be with him because people would laugh at him. Your friends might. They're not my friends if they're not nice to my dad, Kendrick said, sniffing. She picked up the brush and went back to the dog. Peyton had to smile at her spirit and her attitude. For a little girl, 
She was very opinionated and determined. Peyton figured she probably got that from her dad. Maybe your dad doesn't want you to have to choose between loving your friends and loving him. I'll tell dad I don't care about my friends. I just want to be with him. The little girl's words made the back of Peyton's throat close. So sweet and so sad. She sent up a little prayer that God would work things out for this small family and that Kendrick and her dad could be together, whether it was here or whether it was in South Carolina. She didn't like the way that last idea made her feel, empty and fluffy inside. I know your dad will listen to you, so tell him anything you want to. Peyton felt like she was copping out a little but also knew that conversation wasn't hers to have. He won't listen. I've asked him to let me live with him, and he always says no. I can tell you for sure, for absolute certain, that your dad loves you, and that's the reason he said no, because he thought he was doing the best thing for you. What about you? Why are you allowed to live with Dad and I'm not? It's not fair. Daisy whined as Kendrick yanked the brush through her hair. Wait, I'm not living with your dad. Had Kendrick really misunderstood? You're here. You're staying the night. Owen is here too. Maybe Daddy would love me if I was a boy. Her words made Peyton's eyes widen and she glanced up to where Bryce and Owen were throwing the ball. The last thing, the very last thing she wanted was for Kendrick to think Owen and Peyton were trying to take her place. I promise you, I've never stayed here before in my life. I'm working in the library. Normally, I don't leave it except to maybe eat in the kitchen, and I've never come out here to stay over. In fact, this is the first time Owen has been here. I promise you, you will see that Owen and I don't stay here. She looked down at Kendrick while she spoke, but when she was done, she lifted her eyes again. This time, Bryce was looking at her, and she lifted her brows, trying to make her face say, you need to come here, without saying anything. You will be soon. Daddy will send me away and you'll take my place. No one could ever take your place. Your daddy loves you, loves you so much that he would sacrifice being with you in order to give you the very best. At least, what he feels is the very best. Kendrick's lower lip jutted out, but she seemed to be thinking about what Peyton had said. She was a sweet girl and she was also intelligent. Peyton thought she might understand and realize that her dad was doing what he was doing because he loved her. Hopefully, she would also realize that she could probably change his mind. Is everything okay over here? Bryce asked, startling Peyton, who hadn't realized he walked over. You're spending time with Owen, and you're letting Miss Peyton live with you when you won't even let me. You don't love me. Kendrick stood up her eyes filling with tears again as she gripped the brush so tightly her knuckles were white. She didn't run away. She stared up at her dad, as though daring him to contradict her. Bryce's jaw flexed, and his eyes went from Kendrick to Peyton, who shrugged, hoping he would understand she'd been trying to help and not telling Kendrick lies. Then he looked back at Kendrick. Peyton doesn't live here. That's what she said. Owen had followed Bryce over, and he spoke up immediately. We don't. We live in town. We have a bookstore, and Mom makes food to sell sometimes. I don't have a nice yard like this to play catch in, although Mom and I play catch behind the store sometimes. What, do you live in your store? Kendrick said, and not very nicely. We live above it. Mom sleeps on the couch, and I have a bedroom. Bryce's eyes opened wide like he was surprised to hear that Peyton slept on the couch. It wasn't something she would have mentioned to anyone, 
but she never told Owen not to say anything. It didn't matter. It was what it was. The bigger issue for Peyton was that Bryce's daughter seemed to view Peyton and Owen as a threat. She understood why Bryce wanted them there. It helped him break the ice with his daughter in case he couldn't find anything to talk to her about or relate to her with. But their presence wasn't making things better. They were making things worse. And she couldn't stay. Taking a breath, hoping that Bryce understood what she was doing, she spoke. I think Owen and I had better go home. I thought you were staying all night. We were going to make Easter dinner in the morning. I assumed we would go to church together. Her eyes dropped to Kendrick. Then she looked back at Bryce, hoping the answers were written on her face. Maybe we'll see you there. Bryce nodded. He seemed to understand. At least, he didn't seem angry or upset. Kendrick, is it okay if I walk them to their car? Kendrick's face registered surprise that her dad would ask her permission. But then she nodded. Mom, I better put this ball glove away. I'll meet you at the car. Owen held his glove up as he spoke. Then he looked at Kendrick. Would you give me a hand? She gave an uncertain glance at her dad, but then she smiled at Owen, like she was happy someone so much older than she was had included her. Bryce waited until the two kids started to walk away before he turned to Peyton. I'm sorry, he said simply. No, don't be. I didn't realize she was going to be jealous. I think that's the problem. She's not secure in her place with you, so she feels very threatened by us. Do you think I can do something to fix that? He sounded uncertain. It was obvious to Peyton that he really wanted a good relationship with his daughter. She was asking me questions. I didn't feel like it was my story or even my information to give her, but I did tell her that you loved her. That was the reason you did the things you did, because you thought they would be the best for her. Do you think she's too young to understand that? Peyton shook her head. I don't think so. She loves you, and I think she feels the rejection from both parents. Being that her mom isn't around, and you haven't been either, I think, I think she feels unloved. But... I'm doing all of this out of love. Exasperation filled his voice, and he threw a hand up, indicating everything. Peyton took a step closer. She could feel the pain in his heart, feel the frustration at not having made the right decision, not being able to express what he wanted to, and the person who meant the most in the world to him didn't understand. She put a hand on his arm, and immediately he froze, his eyes shooting to hers, dark and turbulent. I know you are. It's so obvious to me you love her, that you want the best for her, that you thought that was what you were doing. I think Kendrick will understand, too. But she probably wants to spend time with you, wants to do things with you to build a relationship not just have you pay for her from a distance. Do things to build a relationship. Peyton smiled, nodding, loving that he was so concerned about wanting his daughter to know he loved her. It was obvious he would do whatever it took. Sure, you build a relationship with someone by spending time with them, talking to them, doing things with them, doing things for them. Gifts, compliments, encouragement. Just hanging out, not saying anything. All of that helps to build a relationship with someone. But that can't work. Not when being with me is going to cause her pain. He pointed to his face, making a circle around all of his scars. I don't even see those anymore when I'm with you, Peyton said softly. How can you not? They're the most obvious thing about me. They're just a part of you. I don't think about them. 
She hesitated, because maybe she shouldn't say what she was about to. I do admire the way you move, watching you play ball with Owen. You're graceful, not in a feminine way, but in a confident, manly way that's very appealing. Some of the turbulence in his eyes dissipated, and they seemed to smile just a little. You were watching. His lips twitched. How could I not? It was a simple question, but she meant it. Wherever he was is where her eyes wanted to go. So do you care how I look? There was still a smile in his eyes, but a little bit of bitterness too, like he knew his looks were important. I admit, I do admire your strength and the way you live. And your broad shoulders, she said with what felt like an embarrassed smile. Before he could say anything else, though, she kept talking. But more than that, I admire the way you treated Owen, the way you cared about him, the way you were patient and made him smile. You didn't have to take time to stand in your backyard and play ball with a kid you barely know. And I admire that more than anything. His expression had changed, and he swallowed loudly, as though pushing past the lump in his throat. His forearm muscles flexed under her fingers, and she tightened her grip just a bit, meaning to be comforting, but she couldn't deny the attraction she felt. She wanted to move closer rather than walk away. He put a hand up, sliding it around her neck under her hair. So, I don't disgust you? Never, never have. She grinned. You might have made me a little angry at times. His smile was guilty. I'm sorry. She shook her head, very conscious of his fingers at the nape of her neck. I don't think I would have gotten angry if I hadn't been so... attracted. You feel it too? She nodded. I want to chase this. I want to see where it goes. I don't want you to leave, but I have to patch things up with my daughter somehow. There'll be time for us once you get everything straightened out. I'm not going anywhere. She felt like she needed to be completely honest. I'm not even sure I'm interested in a relationship anyway. With someone as scarred as I am? Someone who can't go out in polite society without someone recognizing him and insulting and belittling him? Her snort was derisive. <laughs> Do you really think I care about that? Do you really think I'm the kind of person who bases my opinion on what everyone else thinks? I know you're not. That doesn't bother me at all. But I was married once. I'll be frank. It sucked. And I chose him. I'm not sure that I can depend on myself to be able to choose wisely. Obviously, I made a huge mistake. And marriage is forever. At least for me. For me, too. Maybe, maybe that's something you can pray about. Surely, if I'm not right for you, God would let you know somehow. Her eyes widened a bit. She hadn't thought about that. But he was right. Marriage should definitely be something she talked to the Lord about. A decision she didn't make on her own. I take it from your expression that you didn't consult with God before you got married the first time. No. Do you think it might be a little different if you were sure to include him this time? She nodded slowly, unable to find any flaw in his reasoning. Of course not. I'm a little scared to suggest that, because I'm afraid that God doesn't think I'm good enough for you. Don't talk like that. If anything, he was too good. His hand moved to cup her cheek, and she put her hand over top of it, squeezing, looking up into his eyes. I'm not any better than anyone else, and there's no such thing as you not being good enough. That's laughable. 
I would laugh at that if you didn't look so serious. I am. Have you missed it? I've been practically shut up in my house for years, not going out anywhere, living for myself. I can see now how selfish it was of me. Even not having a relationship with Kendrick was selfish on my part. Of course, I didn't want her to be hurt or embarrassed, but part of that was because when she's hurt, it hurts me too. I don't want that. Trust me, I have just as many flaws and issues as you, and I've been allowing fear to control me just as much as you. After all, I'm afraid to get married again. She closed her eyes, shaking her head and turning away. I feel like my fear is justifiable, because marriage isn't something you can just get out of if you don't like it anymore. When you make vows, they're supposed to mean something. They are, to both of you. So if your husband vows to love and cherish you, he should be doing that. But I can't control anyone else. She opened her eyes, knowing she probably looked tortured, and she didn't mean to be dramatic, but she couldn't help it. I can't make my husband do anything. I can't make him have character. I can't make him stay true. I can't make him be kind or nice. I can't make him love me. There was the problem. Her ex had left her. He'd taken great delight in telling her to her face that he didn't love her and never had. It had been painful. Maybe one of the most painful experiences of her life because she loved him. She'd been the best wife she could be. She'd given him everything she had. If he couldn't love her after she'd given him so much, how could anyone? You're right. You admitted yourself that you chose him and you didn't pray about it. Didn't ask God what you should do. You just went ahead. Am I right? She nodded. She let out a shaky breath. And... I know you're right when you said it would probably be different if I asked God what I should do and waited to get an answer from Him. So there's no need to be afraid, because you know that what God put in front of you is what you need to do, no matter how hard or how painful it might be. Because those hard things and those trying people make us better? Someone told me that not long ago. Someone very wise. He smiled a little, and she had to grin back. Nothing like having her words thrown up in her face. So, maybe we can take things slow, and both of us will talk to the Lord about what he wants us to do. Deal? Her heart swelled. This was the kind of man she wanted. Someone who encouraged her to become a better Christian someone who lifted her up, someone who made her want to do the same and more for him because he helped her become better. That was the kind of man she wanted to be married to. And that was the kind of woman she wanted to be for her husband, someone who made him a better man. Chapter 20 Good Communication Allison in Texas Owen eyed Kendrick, who walked beside him. He walked slowly, wanting to give his mom as much time with Kendrick's dad as he could. He hadn't realized until he'd come over and seen Kendrick's sad face that maybe his playing with Mr. Bryce had upset her. She hadn't seen her dad for a long time, and maybe she wanted to spend some time with him. Owen could relate. Sometimes when his dad would come over to eat and bring his new girlfriend and their kids, Owen resented the other kids that were there because they took his dad's attention from him. He didn't really think that Mr. Bryce was the same as his dad, though. Otherwise, he wouldn't have wanted his mom to get together with him. It had taken him a long time, years, 
before he realized his dad was never going to want him. Kendrick's dad obviously did want her. Sometimes adults just didn't know how to go about getting what they wanted. You really love your dad. He had to start this conversation somewhere. That seemed like as good of a place as any. Kendrick narrowed her eyes at him. She might only be ten, but she had been through a lot, just like he had, and he figured she probably would understand what he was trying to do once he explained it to her. If he could get past her suspicion and resentment. His mom would tell him he was acting like an adult again. She often accused him of that, and he wasn't sure what to say. Sure, the kids around him didn't act the way he did, and sometimes he found them immature. Maybe because he spent so much time with his mom. Or maybe he was just born old. It's okay to admit you love your parents. You're supposed to. He tried to speak casually, kicking at the top of the grass and acting like the conversation he was trying to have wasn't extremely important. Even though it was. He doesn't love me, so I'm not going to love him. Sometimes adults do stupid things when they love someone. They think they're doing it for their own good, but they just don't see everything. Dad doesn't want me with him. That means he doesn't love me. Not necessarily. If he thinks you're better off where you are, it means he loves you more than what you know. Your mom said something like that but I don't believe her. Kendrick's voice still sounded belligerent, but he could tell she was softening. She glanced over at him, and he could see the conflict in her eyes. You can tell for sure that sometimes people really don't want their kids. My dad, for example. He doesn't want me. That's not because it's for my own good. It's because he's selfish. Kendrick didn't say anything but her steps slowed a little, and he could tell she was thinking about what he said. Your dad, on the other hand, is being unselfish. At least, he thinks he is. But I think I have a way of maybe getting him to want to keep you here in North Dakota. Really? Kendrick's head spun to him, and her bad attitude was forgotten. Her eyes were large and hopeful. He understood the hope. He felt that way a lot. But he thought, was pretty sure, that Kendrick's hope was justified. Yeah, but you and I are going to have to work together. He was pretty sure the look on her face said that he was going to be able to get her to go along with his plan. Maybe it wasn't exactly a plan. It was just a hope. Work? I'm not old enough to go to work. Kendrick sniffed at him like she'd decided he was full of hot air and wasn't going to listen to him anymore. Although she didn't stop, but continued walking beside him slowly. Not go to work, silly. He made sure he said silly with a goofy grin, so she'd know he wasn't making fun of her or putting her down. Listen, I want a dad. My dad left when I was little. My mom is lonely. She might not admit it, but she is. Kendrick crossed her arms over her chest, holding tight to the ball she carried. So? My mom is pretty nice. You'll really like her. She can bake anything, and she really cares about people. He didn't want to talk too well about his mom, but he did want Kendrick to get a little bit sold on her, because... I think she likes your dad a lot. I know she does, and I don't want her to because she's taking all his attention. That might be a good thing, he hurried on because Kendrick had that stubborn look on her face again. If they get together, not only will you have a dad, but he's going to want you here. After all, when a man is married, he wants his kids with him. That wasn't necessarily true, but he hoped Kendrick was too little to see the holes in that logic. So I would have a dad, you would get a mom, and we'd both have a family. Plus, 
Owen lifted his chin and squared his shoulders. You'd be getting the best big brother in the entire world. Kendrick's brows furrowed, and she had to think about it for a minute before she understood. You're talking about yourself? Yeah, and I would be getting the best little sister in the whole world. It couldn't hurt to compliment her a little bit, although his mom was always saying he shouldn't say things he didn't mean. He wasn't sure if she was actually the best little sister in the entire world, although he had every intention of being the best big brother in the entire world. All that made him a little guilty, but he pushed it aside. Hopefully what he said would be true, and he wouldn't have to worry about it. Think about it, Kendrick. Wouldn't you rather have both a mom and dad? Plus a brother? And... He hesitated because he wasn't sure about this himself. Maybe we would end up with another little brother or sister or a couple of them. Wouldn't you like that? He didn't think his mom was too old to have more babies. She was in her thirties, which was pretty old. But hopefully she could still have more kids, so what he was saying would be true. He didn't like skating on the edge of what was acceptable and right. And... He didn't want to do anything wrong. He could convince Kendrick with lies, but when she found out they were lies, she might never trust him again. And he really did want to be a great big brother. Great big brothers didn't lie. Even about little things that might make someone feel good for a bit, but would just make them feel worse when they found out he wasn't being honest. He'd learned that the hard way from his dad. A baby brother. A baby sister. Kendrick lifted excited eyes to him. Owen made a mental note to ask his mom how old was too old for a woman to have a baby. That might be an awkward question, but he owed it to Kendrick. What do we need to do? She asked, and there was a dreamy quality to her voice. He figured she'd probably been just as lonely as an only child as he. He'd wanted a brother so bad he could taste it most of the time. But he quit asking his mother for one years ago. She'd told him she needed to have a husband before he could have a brother. Once he got a little older, he figured out that wasn't quite true, although it was probably very true for his mother. We need to get them together. We need to give them time to get to know each other and to realize they like each other because of course they're going to like each other. My dad is the best dad in the entire world. Your mom would be crazy not to like him, Kendrick said decisively, but then her eyes fell. At least, I think he would be the best dad in the world. You're going to find out. We're going to get them together, and then wherever we live, we're going to be together. So, how do we push them together? I get behind your mom and you get behind my dad and we push? No. I mean, if we get desperate, we might have to do that. Owen didn't want to rule anything out. It was quite possible they might have to physically tie them up. After all, if they refused to spend time together, that would call for drastic measures. I think they already really like each other. What we need to do now is talk my mom into staying tonight and let them sit together beside the fire. We'll let them spend as much time as they want to together. You and I can hang out, be out of their way, until they decide to get married. Then we'll work on getting attention from our parents. Do you think that will work? Will my dad give me attention once he's married? Kendrick didn't sound like she believed it. I think your dad's going to give you more attention even before he gets married. I think he thought that you would be ashamed of him because of his scars. Don't you say anything about my dad's scars, Kendrick said angrily, stomping her foot and stopping. I'm just being honest with you. Isn't that what you want? You don't want me to lie and tell you things that aren't true. Kendrick's belligerent look faded, and she bit her lip. No, I don't want you to lie to me. And I won't. You can trust me. Owen paused. 
I'm saying that, but I have to admit, I'm not sure how old is too old for a woman to have a baby. My mom is already 30, and that's pretty old. Aunt Carol said she had a baby when she was 40, so I think it's possible. All right, we'll work on that assumption. Although, if you want to ask to make sure, before you agree to help, you can. But I don't want to waste time, and we could have them together tonight. After all, the sooner they get married, the sooner we'll be happy. Aunt Carol says it's your job to make yourself happy, not to look around and expect others to do it for you or expect things to happen to make you happy. Okay, you're right, but every kid wants two parents, so the sooner we get our parents together, the sooner we'll both have a mom and dad, and that will be good for us because everyone knows that kids do better in two-parent homes. He'd heard the statistics over the radio not that long ago. It had made him panic a little and wonder if the reason that he wasn't good at baseball was because he only had a mom and not a dad, too. He didn't want to be behind everyone else just because he didn't have a dad. Plus, it wasn't just about him, but Kendrick deserved to have the best start in life that she could, and that meant having a dad and a mom. He was willing to share his mom because he knew his mom had plenty of love for lots of people. Some people seemed to be limited in the amount that they had, but not his mom. So we're good? He asked, starting toward the shed and opening the door so they could put their equipment away. Yep. When I go back out, I'll act all disappointed that you guys are leaving and beg your mom to stay and ask my dad to ask her to. That's right? That's right. And if we can get them to stay, or if mom won't stay, we'll start tomorrow when she comes back. We have to make sure they have plenty of time together and that they're as close to each other as possible. All right, and I'll practice pushing so that if I have to push her to him, I can. All right, you do that. Kendrick was kind of cute in a little girl kind of way, and he liked that she didn't hold grudges. She could have stayed mad. She could have decided to not go along with his plan at all. I like you, Kendrick, he said, and then she got that funny smile on her face that women did sometimes, and he wished he wouldn't have said anything. It made him uncomfortable. The only one he liked to show his feelings to was his mom, and even then, he liked to be careful. Chapter 21 Picking the right person, someone who shares your values and commitments and priorities, someone who will put you first just like you put them first, someone who will laugh with you and help you be the best person you can be, someone who will support you and grow along with you as you mature in your faith and character. Kate Scheiber Bryce turned with Peyton to walk to her car. His hand fell from her cheek, but hers fell with his, and he slid his fingers between hers, linking them together. She didn't resist. Lord, please give her some sign that I'd be good for her, and to her, and then help me grow into being the man that she needs. They walked in silence around the house to where her car was parked. He hated that she was leaving, but he understood and appreciated her sacrifice. He didn't think that she wanted to go any more than he wanted her to, but he loved that she was willing to step back in order to allow someone else to move in, even a child, especially a child. It showed a humbleness he admired. They look like they're up to something, don't they? Peyton said under her breath as they approached her car. He hadn't seen Kendrick and Owen standing by the driver's side door until she said something. They do. Owen looked deliberately casual, while Kendrick twisted her hands in front of her and could only be described as nervous. 
He didn't know his daughter well enough to know if that was a normal state for her or not, but from the way she acted today, he would guess not. He wanted a relationship with her, as much as he wanted one with Peyton. He wasn't sure how to go about either one of those, although Peyton had given him some good ideas for both of them. He wished Kendrick did not feel threatened by Peyton, though. He supposed he couldn't blame her and vowed that he would give her as much attention as he could, trying to convince her that he loved her and wanted her. It was not hard to see that him sending her away had only made her feel unloved and unwanted. He hadn't meant to do that at all. I think you guys have something on your mind. Want to share? He said as Peyton and he stopped by the car. Maybe he should have pulled his hand away from Peyton's, put some space between them, but it was all he could do not to wrap his arm around her and pull her closer. Holding hands seemed like a good compromise. Hers fit perfectly inside of his, and he wasn't ready, wasn't nearly ready, to pull it away. I changed my mind. I want Owen and Peyton to stay. We can have a bonfire, and sometimes Aunt Carol would make s'mores. Can we make s'mores too? It was starting to get a little chilly, and a bonfire, and a sweatshirt, would feel really good. You changed your mind, he said, even though what he really wanted to say was, absolutely, we'll have them stay, because that's what he wanted. I did. I like Peyton. She said you loved me. That last part came out a little bit uncertainly, and Kendrick bit her lip. But then she lifted her chin, and her little eyes brightened. And she's funny and nice. If she stays, I can pretend she's my mom and you're my dad, and Owen is my big brother, and I'll have a whole family all to myself. Beside him, Peyton gasped a little just a slight sound of sympathy and compassion. It put into words the feeling in his heart, twisted and impossibly hard, and made him want to rewind the years and do them all over again. Impossible. So he pulled his hand from Peyton's and went forward, wrapping his arms around his girl, then straightening, holding her up, pressed against him. I do love you. Peyton was right about that but maybe I haven't been doing a very good job of showing it. I want to protect you, because to me, love is protection. But maybe, to you, love is me spending time with you. I want to spend time with you, Daddy. It wasn't exactly an answer, or maybe it was. But her arms came around him and squeezed his neck hard enough to choke him. He figured if he passed out, it would just be the beginning of what he deserved. So he didn't try to loosen her arms, but instead closed his eyes and said another short prayer that he would be the father Kendrick deserved, that she needed, the best that he could be. He would start today. He held her for a moment and only vaguely realized that Owen had gone over and put his arm around his mother. She put her arm around his shoulder and they stood there together in the driveway for he didn't know how long. Finally, he pulled back a little so he could look his daughter in the eye. I'm sorry I haven't done a very good job of showing you. I'm going to try to do better. She took both his cheeks in her hands, and he couldn't describe how that made him feel. Loved, yes, but amused, too. A little disconcerting. You can start by finding me a mom. Owen jerked his head at that, and Bryce moved his eyes toward the boy. He had an extremely guilty look on his face. He also looked slightly scared. But Kendrick's words made Bryce smile as his eyes lifted and they met Peyton's. She was smiling too. So, Owen had a little talk with Kendrick when they were putting their ball gloves away. I hope you don't think I had anything to do with that, Peyton said with a brow lifted. I wouldn't mind if you had, 
He honestly would have loved it if she had. If she had wanted him bad enough to get their kids to conspire with her to help her catch him. Now that was an ego boost. Of course, it was what he wanted too, which probably helped his reaction. Her smile widened, and so did his. He looked away from Peyton and back at his daughter. Did you have someone in mind? He asked, like he hadn't already figured it out. I like Peyton, and Owen will be the best big brother ever. Hendrick looked at Owen with something akin to hero worship. Bryce didn't have any experience in stitching families together. He just hoped that was hero worship like a big brother hero worship and wouldn't develop into anything else. He supposed that was a bridge to cross when they came to it. I think you have really good taste. Maybe I can get your advice on a few things. After all, you're a girl just like Peyton is. And I'm not very good with girls. But I'm learning, he added, just because he was serious about caring how she felt. And Peyton, too. That's fine, Daddy. You can talk to me anytime, Kendrick said, hugging his neck maybe a little harder than strictly necessary. And Bryce focused on not flinching. How about for now, we stay here and we'll have a bonfire together? Owen's voice broke into their conversation. He'd been quiet, because, unless Bryce missed his guess, Owen was the reason for Kendrick's change of heart. With that thought came another. Did Owen have something to do with Peyton being out here in the first place? Maybe he could get Owen alone and he'd ask. And maybe it didn't matter. I guess we'll have to see what your mom has to say about that. But as for me, I couldn't think of anything I want more. That was true. He raised his brows at Peyton, who smiled back at him. I think that sounds like a great idea. He turned, allowing Kendrick to slide down but holding on to her hand, which she grasped eagerly. He put an arm around Peyton's shoulders, allowing Owen to keep his arm around her waist, and they went like that to the fire pit behind the house. He was able to get a fire started, and, contributing to his suspicion that there might be some kind of conspiracy going on, there just so happened to be fresh s'more supplies in the cupboard. Charlene was sweet and kind, and he couldn't imagine that she would be conspiring with Owen to try to match anyone together. But she would have been the one who left the supplies. He chuckled when he remembered that she told him that she didn't do anything extra, and he'd have to learn to take care of himself. <laughs> All talk. They sat around the campfire laughing, talking, and eating s'mores until long after the sun went down. He'd found camp chairs from the shed, and they brushed them off. Bryce should have expected it, but Owen and Kendrick made sure that Peyton sat beside him, with Owen beside his mother and Kendrick beside him. He wasn't sure what time of night it was when the kids drifted off to sleep. Kendrick first, snuggled under a blanket and curled up in her chair. Owen not long after. He snorted slightly, which made Bryce and Peyton look at each other and laugh. I can't laugh too hard, because I'm pretty sure I snore too. That's okay. I think there's something a little bit comforting to wake up in the middle of the night and hear someone else breathing, or snoring, beside you. Sometimes in the middle of the night, you feel like you're all alone. That little bit of sound from another human makes you realize you're not. Peyton spoke softly and he thought maybe they were more similar than what he had suspected. Your scars from your marriage are on the inside. My scars from the accident are on the outside. And scars are just that. Reminders that we've been through something hard, and we came out stronger than we were before. I guess I had too much of myself tied up in my looks, and in my ability to play baseball. 
I think that's what a lot of us look to for our vindication, our self-worth, our looks, our abilities, our accomplishments. We forget that our value is in our position as children of God, and our worth is in His love for us. That's something I wish I had known sooner, something I needed these scars to know. I suppose the lessons are good, as long as I learn. I have a tendency to not want to. I haven't seen that tendency. He appreciated that when she looked at him, she saw the best. Not the scars, not his failures, not his mistakes and faults. It made him want to be the man she saw. The fire had died down to embers. He loved spending time with her, talking and just staring into the fire, and didn't want the evening to end. If I throw another log on the fire, will you find us some music so I can dance with you? He'd surprised her, for sure. She looked at him, her mouth open, her eyes wide. Nothing crazy. Maybe it's just an excuse to hold you. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what it is. You can just ignore me. They decided to take it slow. Yet, here he was, pushing for more. Just because he wanted to keep her in his arms. No, I think that's a wonderful idea. I'm just upset I didn't think of it first. She grinned, pulling her phone out and swiping. Bryce threw a couple of logs on the fire, the sparks flying, the crackling sound floating around in the night air, the stars bright overhead, and the cool North Dakota breeze flowing over it all. He didn't recognize the music she started to play, but it was something slow and low, and exactly what he had been intending. May I? He asked, coming over and offering her his hand. Please, she said, taking his hand and standing with him. They barely moved away from the chairs before he encircled her with his arms, and she put hers around his neck. Is it just my imagination, or do we fit together perfectly? I think we fit together perfectly, she humphed. <laughs> if we didn't, I think that's something we could work around. But what amazes me is that when you and I were talking earlier, I thought to myself that one of the signs for me that the Lord was in this would be that Kendrick would come around and that she would accept me. I thought it would take weeks, if not months or more. And yet, she seemed to really get on board with the idea of having a mom. And she seemed to be okay with the idea of that being me. She laughed and shook her head. <laughs> Not that I'm asking you to marry me or anything, just I was so scared about making another huge mistake. I don't want to be trapped in another terrible marriage. I don't want to have an ex that I can barely stand, who did everything in his power to hurt me as much as he could. I just want to live a life with no drama. She was doing something to the hairs at the back of his neck, and he wanted to close his eyes but he also didn't want to miss a second of looking at her. But I don't think that's the kind of life God wants us to lead. I think he wants us to put ourselves out there, to know that life can be messy and hard at times, that even though it is, he wants us to look to him, to get our strength from him, and to use those messy times to grow and become better. He couldn't agree more. Being with Peyton was far better than anything he'd experienced up to that point in his life. And he wouldn't be the man he was if he hadn't experienced all the bad times. The first song ended, but neither of them moved to pull away. A second song started, and they started swaying again. I guess as long as there's music, we'll keep dancing, he murmured. I have a confession to make. Yeah, he said, 
figuring he had a confession too. That playlist will last us all night. He wasn't expecting that and huffed out a soft laugh. <laughs> I like the way you think. I was hoping you would. She pulled back just a bit and looked up at him. What is your confession? He stopped swaying, his body stilling. Could he tell her? Maybe it was something he saw in her eyes, something warm and reassuring, something that said she was feeling the same things he was. He decided to be bold. I want to kiss you. Her eyes widened a bit, but then her lips curved up. That's why I put so much music on my playlist, hoping that if we danced long enough, you'd eventually feel like you had to kiss me to get rid of me. I'm not interested in getting rid of you. His head lowered. But I am definitely interested in kissing you, and I didn't need any music to make me feel that way. Me either, she murmured, just before his lips settled on hers. It was a long time before he lifted his head, and dawn was streaking across the eastern sky before they stopped dancing and put their children to bed. They made it to church on time, but for Bryce at least, it was hard to stay awake, even though he loved the celebration of the empty tomb and the sacrifice the cross represented. As they sat down to Easter dinner, ham and potatoes that weren't perfect, and a pineapple casserole that was, their children between them, happily chatting, Bryce knew they might have said they'd take things slow, but he was sure Peyton was the woman he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. Epilogue Being truthful, loving, being willing to work together, praying together, making Jesus a top priority in your life and family. Thelma E. Tollefson, Tacoma, Washington Dwight Eckenrode held a plate filled with potato salad, chips, and two hamburgers. There was also some kind of unknown gelatinous salad he hadn't been able to resist because of its bright blue color. He hadn't decided whether he was going to eat that or just look at it. It was the first time in his life he'd put food on his plate more to decorate it than to eat it. Sweetwater, North Dakota had that effect on him. Actually, Orchid Baldwin had that effect on him. You gonna stand there and daydream? Or are you gonna sit down with us? Bryce bumped his arm with his shoulder as he walked by, holding a plate heaped with food in one hand and a cup of sweet tea in the other. I'm coming. Man, you need to get over her. Bryce's words didn't match the sympathy in his eyes. I've tried. There was no point in denying he was pining over Orchid. But he didn't have to ruin everyone's day, especially since his friend was practically walking on air since he'd proposed to Peyton the evening before, and she now sported a sparkling diamond ring on her graceful left hand. He watched as Peyton came back after settling the kids and setting her own food down, taking Bryce's plate from him and giving Dwight a sympathetic look. Hun. Maybe you should introduce Dwight to the peacemakers. Dwight's brows furrowed as he tried to figure out exactly who she was thinking he needed to be introduced to and why. Bryce froze in the act of leaning down to plant a kiss on his fiancé's temple. Are you sure about that? He asked, his face showing that he definitely wasn't sold on the idea. Although whether that was because he was concerned about Dwight or concerned about the peacemakers, Dwight wasn't sure. Peyton smiled up into Bryce's eyes, a smile full of confidence, but also of love and affection. Dwight wanted to look away, but he found himself studying his friend, 
Noting the return look of adoration, and knowing that Bryce had never been more content in his life before. Peyton had been the best thing that ever happened to him, by far. Maybe Bryce was right. Even with Dwight's eternal optimism, he couldn't ever imagine Orchid looking at him the same way. Dwight, I need to introduce you to some ladies. Bryce dropped that kiss on his fiancée's temple. Some unspoken communication passed between them as she took his plate and cup, and Bryce watched her go for a moment before he turned to Dwight. This way. Maybe I don't want to be introduced. Maybe this is your only hope. For what? For Orchid. And that's a big if, if they'll take you. Take me? When I introduce you, I'll mention that you're planning on moving to Sweetwater. I am? Yeah, you're not taking Orchid away from her family in the town who loves her. I can't get Orchid to walk to the park with me, let alone leave town. Well, the peacemakers are the matchmaking ladies who set Peyton and me up. But they're pretty particular, and I can't guarantee that they'll think you and Orchid are a good match. They might have someone else in mind for her. The idea of Orchid with someone else tore at Dwight's insides to the point where he almost clutched his stomach. If they don't take me, I'll figure things out on my own. At this statement, Bryce stopped. It would be best to accept their help. They're uncanny in their knowledge of who belongs together. Bryce tilted his head. Maybe they'll decide you belong with someone else. No. He tried, but ever since he'd met Orchid, he hadn't been able to get interested in anyone else, not even a little. Bryce started walking, heading toward a group of older ladies sitting at a table together. The one in the middle with the pretty blue hair seemed to be the ringleader. All right, follow my lead and try to make yourself look like a son of Sweetwater. A son of what? Dwight said, but it was too late because Bryce had stopped in front of the table. The lady's chatter died out, and their heads turned to look at him. What had he gotten himself into? Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.